I want to stay right here with you in childlike faith. With childlike faith. And all in wonder of everything you've done and who you are, God. I want to stay right here with childlike faith. Of our first love, of our first. 
all those pieces you try to sweep under the rug Cause you were ashamed of your broken mess Come bring it to me Come bring it to me Cause I saw you in your hiding And I'm calling you out, come bring it to me Come bring it to me Cause there's nothing I'm ashamed of All I see, all I see when I see you Is my son, I see absolute perfection Inside of you So bring it to me, bring it to me Everything you try to sweep under the rug Come bring it to me Come bring it to me I hear him say, I'm not like your family I'm not ashamed of your mess Come and bring it to me Cause there's absolutely nothing that you've done That I can't fix for you Just come and cry out to me Come and bring it to me afraid of the mess you've made I'm not afraid of anything you've done Just come and bring it to me tonight I'm restoring your heart I'm restoring your well-being I'm restoring your mind Restoring your emotions Just lean in And breathe deep And watch me do it Come watch me do it And lean back And breathe In the light of his power In the 
And our destination is established So we speak where we're going Or we begin to prophesy Cause our path is well lit And our destination is established So we speak where we're going Oh, we prophesy, we prophesy We prophesy where we're going, where we're going Into greater glory where we're going, where we're going Into greater glory where we're going, where we're going Into greater glory is well lit and our destination is established so we speak oh we speak to where we're going and we prophesy tonight oh our path is well lit we can see straight ahead straight ahead of us destination before I was even born oh so we follow the leader we follow the leader into even more even more even more we follow your lead into Oh, we're not going 
find a hill in a handbasket Cause we know whose we are We know whose we are We know whose we are And you're not done, you're not done You're not finished, you're not finished You're not done and you're not finished So we speak exactly what you're saying We release your righteousness, your goodness Your mercy, your peace here and now Let the reign of your kingdom come Cause our God reigns forever And our God reigns forever And our God reigns Yes, He does Yes, He does Thank you, Lord Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus that you've already visited us. You're already here. Even before we walked into the doors, you were here waiting for us. Lord, I thank you. That means you're going to do something powerful this weekend, Lord, in every life that's here. We thank you ahead of time for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. 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 Thank you. You may be seated. You know, there's something about the worship tonight that reminded me of Psalm 23. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters and he restores my soul. There was something very restorative and healing about the worship tonight. Amen. It was just very like it touched you in a deep way. Or am I the only one? Are you with me? That's why. That's why I want to encourage you, anytime you see Kevin up here, we're about ready to start at any time. So uh, speaking of which, tomorrow morning, even though the teaching is going to start at 10 a.m., Kevin and the team will be uh, worshiping beginning at 930. So get here nice and early. And as you can see now, I know for me, I'm just speaking for myself and I don't usually say it like this. I know my heart is wide open right now for whatever God has. Amen. You too. For whatever God has and worship helps usher us into that place. So. I'm telling you, be here at 9.30 tomorrow. Um, we have so many wonderful things. I'm not at liberty to say yet, but you do not want to miss tomorrow. There's some special things, of course, with the kids and the simulators, but uh, Kevin had it on his heart to do some very special things we've never done before tomorrow. So please be here for that. It's going to be exciting. And uh, we welcome all those that are watching uh, on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, just wave at us if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, we can't see you, but... Uh, <laughs> But we're glad you're there. And if you've not subscribed to YouTube, please do, uh, because we have videos. Kevin has videos coming out constantly and continually. And uh, we have uh, even short videos that are coming out lately. Powerful. They just hit you right away. How many have seen those? You're, you're agreeing. I can see they just hit you really hard, really quick. Man, it's a little, it's a little jolt. Uh, so uh, please sign up for YouTube. We have a whole bunch of uh, events coming up. I don't know if you've seen the event page. Uh, we have Kevin uh, want to do these one-nighters at the end of May. Of course, we have Pennsylvania coming up. Uh, please come to Pennsylvania. We're almost full there. And then we have these one-nighters. Kevin's literally coming to Concord one day. Then the next day, he's in Georgia. Then the next day, he's in Florida. Then the next day, he's in Texas. Then the next day, he's in Arizona. Then the next day, he's in Santa Maria, California. So if you live anywhere in the South, we're going to be somewhere near you uh, in the, at the end of May. And so please come and be part of those one-nighters. You can sign up online because the one-nighters uh, have more of a limited seating. So get on there and sign up and be a part of that. We'd love to see you there. And we have so many wonderful things going on. We're just excited to be here. You sound like a wild crowd already. You sound like you're ready to go. Uh, how many are ready to take an offering? You know... As the ushers come, uh, Kevin likes to talk about 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, where Paul just admonishes the Corinthians to, uh, uh, for their liberal, joyful, happy, willing giving uh, for the things of God. And uh, if the Lord has blessed you and the Lord has touched your finances uh, like he is for all of us, 
We want to bless those who aren't at that place yet, but they're getting there. And we want to bless the, the children. We want to bless, bless the single moms and all the other things that God is doing with this ministry. So I know if you've heard Kevin uh, share before, I know that I know you're a, you're a warrior knows crowd. Amen. And so I know that you've already prepared in your heart before you even got here what you're going to give because you're that type of crowd. And again, I've never said that before, but I know that you know this ministry and uh, I know you know what's going on here. And uh, this, this ministry is all about giving and uh, about uh, uh, blessing uh, people. And uh, across the front here, we have uh, single moms that we, we honored and students and so on and so forth. So uh, you need to be a part of what God, God is doing. And, uh, and we're blessed to be here. Amen. We're blessed to partner with what God is doing. So if you're making out a check, you can make it out to Warrior Notes. If you're giving online, there should be a uh, number on your screen. You can do text to give. But let's pray as we give. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to just sow cheerfully, liberally, Lord. And we just thank you that you love a cheerful giver. And Lord, we thank you that we're a part of a move of God. And Lord, this is one little way that we can express our love for you and what you're doing across the world. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Sixto, will you come? Where are you, sir? Come on up. He's got an announcement for us. Praise God. Guys, it's awesome to be in your hometown. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What a welcome we've had in all the... the everyone, the, the team, and just being here with you guys in Virginia Beach. Amen. So Pastor Susan and I are from the church in Tampa, Florida, and God has given us the privilege of opening up a food operation. We don't call it a bank. We don't call it a pantry. We just call it a cost-free grocery store. And what it does is supports and takes care and helps over 5,000 families a month. Amen. And we bless families. So to the Blessing with Warrior Notes Ministry, we're about to expand, and uh, we just, we've come to your community to be a blessing to your community. So, here's what we want to do. Tomorrow morning, in fact, first of all, let me ask this, a show of hands, where are all the Warrior Notes students? Come on, raise your hands. All right. Hallelujah. Amen. So, guess what, students? Tomorrow morning, 830 if you will come and let's be the hands and feet of Jesus tomorrow morning. In the back of the room, we have about uh, 3,600 pounds of food that we brought with us on the truck, the Warrior Nose truck. We're going to pack some bags tomorrow morning. And then what we're going to do, first of all, we're going to take care of all the widows and all the single moms, single dads, and anyone that has a need. We want to get out to the community and we want to pass these bags of groceries out. Amen. And so if you will come and bring your hands with you at 8.30 tomorrow morning, we're going to do it right here in the back of the room. I think Amarillo we did in less than 40 minutes. So less than 40 minutes is the record that we were able to pack 200 bags in Amarillo. So let's see if you guys can beat the record 40 minutes from Amarillo to here in Virginia Beach. Amen. So 8.30 tomorrow morning. Come on out. Let's have a blast. Amen. Serving Jesus. Praise God. Pastor Mike. Thank you, thank you. Pastor, Mike, Pastor, Mike. <laughs> pastor, 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 wow. Virginia, man, the glory is here already. Man, it's here already. And let me tell you, you guys know this, but we always want to honor, we always start off by saying this. Everything that's happening at Warrior Notes is because people like you guys here, like watching, that have decided to partner with this ministry, that have decided to partner and get behind Kevin and Kathy's vision, you guys are the one that are making this possible. And, um, you know, if, if we opened up a store and we gave you a shopping cart, we said you have 30 seconds to fill it with everything you could, I don't care what pain or ache you thought you had, <laughs> you would be tearing it up, right? And what Kevin and Kathy's heart is, is that this weekend, you come with your spiritual shopping cart, okay? You receive everything from every one of these teachings, from the worship, from the study guides, from all these things, because heaven has everything you need, okay? How many of you know the, you found out the world didn't have what you needed, right? But Jesus had everything all along. So partners, thank you so much for making this possible. Everybody got their study guides, all right? You could thank a partner for that. 
the CD as well. You can thank a partner for that. You guys are making this possible, these one-nighters. So thank you guys for everything you're doing. And thank you for praying, because we can feel it. I know we can feel it. And God is moving in incredible ways. So thank you, partners, for everything you're doing this weekend and that you made this possible. And um, so students, Pastor Sixto's got it going already, but how many students we got here today? Let me see you guys again. Fantastic. A lot of them. We're taking over Virginia. Amen. We're right at the door of 27,000 students all over the world. And it was Kevin and Kathy's heart and vision to start these courses so you can get your education, so you can be discipled. Because we have a lot of churches that are really good at filling seats, but Jesus said, don't, he never said go and fill a church. He said, go and make disciples. And so that's the vision of the school that Kevin has. And so I want to encourage you guys with this. We have the Encountering God's Normal Conference. You got the study guide, but he's also made a very special course for this. And in this course, he's video, the video sessions are nowhere else. You can't find them on YouTube. You can't find them anywhere else. He makes them only for students. And he's doing that course at half off, which to get an uh, accredited college credit, typically nationwide, you're well between six and $700 per credit hour. But um, you can get a credit hour course on Encountering God's Normal for only $35 this weekend. And so that, I mean, that barely pays the electric bill, trust me. <laughs> but Kevin wants you to fill up that spiritual shopping cart. So I want you guys to get ready because your lives are about to be transformed because of Jesus. And so take notes, come help um, pack tomorrow, come uh, be a part of all these things because heaven's shopping doors are open for you. Amen? Amen. Dr. Kevin Zadai. Are you all ready? Yeah. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. I, I have so many messages that are coming to me through the worship. Um, I changed my message like four times <laughs> because the spirit, that's the way the spirit is. You know, you're, you're left with yourself staring in the mirror until the spirit comes. And then you've got options that you didn't have before. And really, when you think about it and the day we live in, it's all about options. And um, if you can... If you can just be God's normal, which is, is, is a heavenly realm, if you could just be normal like God, God is normal, you're going to stand out. You won't have to make any effort whatsoever. Um, you know, I used to, I used to think that, that Christians were boring when I wasn't saved, and I thought, well, you know, why would I want to, why would I want to go to Africa? And be a missionary because that was being a Christian to me. It's so weird. It's like you pick you you pick something and you think that's that's what God's going to make you do, you know. And that's our view of God uh, as unredeemed. But when we get born again, there should be some things that change our, our mindset. And as we're exposed more to the things of God. And the Word of God becomes a person and not just pages in a Bible, then your relationship with Him will allow you to go further and you'll become God's normal. And that's why I wrote the book God's Normal. It's the first major release on our own publishing company. And I, I, decided, I decided it was just time to do that. And um, everybody, I thought everybody would be happy when I was sent back. I thought that everything would be an amazing, um, amazing journey down here. And I found out that Jesus was actually expected for many, many thousands of years. And the people that were assigned to give out the word of God and to be judges, which is actually the word for Elohim, is actually the word judges as well as gods with a small g. That's how profound a judge is. A judge can make decisions that determine a person's destiny. And so Jesus said to them, are ye not Elohim to whom the word of God was given? And 
that shook him up because in context, the proper interpretation would be, are ye not gods? Because in context, he was claiming to be the son of God, which to them was equal to God. And, and his argument was, well, are, isn't it written in your law? He didn't say his law, and he's the one that gave it to Moses. Amen. But see, he gave him 10 commandments, and they made it 613. <laughs> so he said, is it, is it not written? Well, well that, that is the most controversial verse in the Bible. You think talking about tongues to somebody is hard. <laughs> you try telling people that made in the image of God means you put God and, an, and you, you put God and you, and you set that person that's redeemed on a throne, as it says in the book of Revelation and in Colossians chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. If you start, if you start talking about being seated with Christ in the heavenly realms, you start talking about he who overcomes will sit with me on a throne, and you start talking about Genesis 1.26, which even the nearly inspired version hasn't taken out yet. And you said, we're made in the image. If you take an image of something and then you have the original and you put them beside each other, if it's really good image, you're not going to be able to tell the difference. Well, that'll get you kicked out of church, which is why I'm in a hotel. <laughs> because every revivalist got kicked out. Every person found themselves a sidewalk, a tent, and kept on going. Amen. And you call them heroes, but they wanted to kill them. And that's what Jesus said. He goes, you want to kill me. We want to, it says, because you claim to be the son of God, which is what they were waiting for. Yeah. And they were trusted with the prophets and the law at the proper time, they were supposed to say, behold, the Lamb of God. They were supposed to announce the Messiah when all those scriptures were fulfilled. So the Pharisees were the keepers of the law. And Jesus told them that, that you are supposed to be taking yokes off of people, but you're putting them on them. And then all the terrible things that they were doing, he, he exposed them. But they didn't recognize the fulfillment of prophecy when he stood before them. And this is why is because Jesus was God's normal. But the system had become corrupt. So now they hated the one they hoped for. Are you following me? Okay, so I had to write this book, God's Normal, because at any one moment in time, if you look through history, the, the normal changes. It shifts with culture and with all the things that happen in that culture, in that generation, you'll find that, you know, one generation God heals and the next generation that he doesn't anymore. And there's, there's times where God will, you know, will have you prosper, you know, like Abraham, you know, he, he left everything and he, he was in Southern Iraq, you know, in, uh, right there by Kuwait in Ur of the Chaldees, he was, he was Iraqi. And God appeared to him and said, I'm going to make you a nation. I'm going to make you so that your descendants are going to be so numerous, you're not going to be able to count them. And I'm going to change your name. And I want you to go to the land that I've called you to. And when you get there, I'll tell you. And he made him a nation, but he was Arab. He was Middle Eastern. And now they fight each other. So Abraham left everything. And by chapter 13, it says he was very rich. Okay, Isaac, his son, the next generation, sowed during famine. I don't know if you know anything about farming, but if you are a plant killer in your house, you can easily do this <laughs> in a field. <laughs> so... You don't sow seeds in famine. If there's, a, if there's a drought, you just don't sow. You don't waste the seed because it's a lose-lose. 
You don't even, you just opt out. So he sowed in famine and reaped a hundredfold. And it, that word there is, is an exponential number, not a multiplication number. All right, so how, why did he? Why did he? Well, yeah, the, the easy answer would be yes, he was under the covenant. But the other answer that I want to talk about is that he, he really had the wells that his father had dug. Why, why, do you, why do you say that, Kevin? Because if you just keep reading, it says that the Philistines, the enemy, was so mad and jealous that he had reaped a hundredfold that they went and stopped up his father's wells. Okay, so that's how you know. See, so there was a practical explanation that was supernatural, but it had to do with a covenant. And Isaac tapped into that covenant, his inheritance. He had those wells. He inherited the wells. So the enemy wants to stop your inheritance. He wants you to not have a handoff. He wants you to not have anything to hand off to the next generation. But see, that's not God's normal. God's normal is he has a family. He has a line, a bloodline, and he wants to preserve that. And it's all through the Bible. That's what he did with Noah. He preserved the eight. There was nothing in their genetics. There was, it says that they were perfect in their genealogies, or their, the word there is for genetics. So they hadn't been infiltrated. There was only eight of them. So anything that was hybrid, that was, had mixed seed, bad blood, did not make it on the ark. That's why Barney the dinosaur was not on the ark. And nobody else was allowed on the ark. No one else could get on the ark. God shut the door. This is the way it was. He repented that he had made man because he was having a bad day over it. So he was sorry that he had even started the whole thing because it had become corrupt. Okay, but the salvation part of this through the Bible is God still was normal to certain people. He appeared to them. He, he encouraged them. He made covenants with them. But the real sacrifice was still ahead at the cross. So there was all these animal sacrifices and all these offerings and things like that that we go through. And I, I have to set this up because I have to show you before we get into the lesson tonight that God builds upon and establishes, he, he reveals things, and then he, he steps back, and he lets us have a sila. He lets us calmly think about that, and we have to process, but what has happened is we have lost that ability somehow through the, through the corporate uh, church. The process is how many people showed up, and what was the offering? And nothing about like, um, nothing about like what happened in Dalton, where like 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 in, we're going to do it every everywhere we go. So like up here, there's flags. There's flags everywhere. I want kids to come up and worship, and they have their own flags, and they can keep them. And we have grown-up flags, and you can't keep those because we want to take those to the next city. <laughs> but we have grown-up flags that are going to require you to be checked out by Lou here. He's the He's going to check you out, just like he checks me out in the jet. He's going to check you out, make sure you can handle a big flag. Because they, they could be a weapon, you know. But anyway, the bottom line was this in Dalton, we, the Lord, I was not getting, we, were, we have to transition in the next two months. So after June, whether you're ready for it or not, we're shifting gears in our services. Because I've waited a couple years, and I've, I've preached three-hour sessions for five years to sow all this seed, the word. But, you know, I'm expecting a harvest from that. Now, 27,000 students, that's, that's a harvest. But it's going to 250,000 students. So we're still way far behind. So I'm not thinking like, well, wow, 27,000 students. No, there is more, more uh, people out there. There's people out there that are called to help 
us sow seed, which is the word of God. Okay, so God builds upon what he says and then he reveals himself and he allows people to assimilate it. But what happens is, is we're going to have to go and shift so that by August, we have to go to the next step. So in Dalton, I went ahead and tested the waters for this, got the flags out, called the kids up. And um, we had, um, in Dalton, I don't remember how many kids were in that class, but we had 100, I think almost yeah, it was about 100. 100 salvations, you know, 100 kids publicly confessed Jesus Christ. And, and, and just, yes, but, but the, thi- the thing of it is, is that I don't think, I, I can't get into it, but, but I just went through a test where, where I had to see where the ministers were and where the people were. And nobody knows except my staff what I did, but uh, the ministers failed the test. So 63 kids got uh, saved in, um, just in Tulsa. Or where, where was that? Tulsa. Was that Tulsa? Gee, it seemed like so long ago. That was last week. <laughs> anyway, here's my point is, is that one of the children in Dalton, he was given a flag. We gave him a flute. We gave all the kids flags, flutes. They had everything. It was like Christmas. And the little boy was yelling, this is the best day of my life. And the, the power of God was so strong. Everybody was twirling. All the kids were up here twirling and, and, and worshiping. And I said, y'all adults, I mean, when are you going to jump in? The water's fine. And I said, come on up here. You know, and it, it, it became this beautiful thing that this is what you know, we're all about. This is what I'm all about is, is, is full participation in a corporate anointing. And as long as nobody gets hurt, you know, so you don't want a BB gun because you're going to, you know, shoot your eye out. No, you know, we're not going to, you know, that kind of thing. No, we're not going to, we're not going to, we're not going to hurt people, but we want people to be able to be free. So this boy ran up and he sat in Brittany's lap while she was playing. And um, he just wanted to, to say, to sing and or I don't know what he did, said something in the microphone and he was just so happy. And then something was said to him, and I, know I might get this wrong because I talked to our sponsor in, in, in Dalton, Georgia, and I, I, got, I got this story pretty, pretty close. Um, but I, I will hopefully don't have to take the stand on this accuracy, but the bottom line was the, the, uh, this, this boy was told, well, you can do this in your house. And he said, we don't have a house. We live in our car. And um, he said, they took him out. He took him out, and his, his parents and his sister, and, uh, like a dog, were in that car. And they had gone to the conference all weekend. And so my point is this, is what is ministry? And if it doesn't involve love, is it really ministry? Because love, love is going to extend out beyond our comfort at times. And, and um, this little boy blessed everybody, but he was the happiest kid in the whole place. And we had, I think we had like 15 or 1,600 people signed up. And I don't know how many showed up. It was 1,200, 1,300 people. We had the whole convention center. And um, that, that boy was, he was touched by God. And I asked all the adults to come up and participate in this. And they were really slow because it's this huge place. And, you know, it's far. I can't even see the faces in the back. It's so big. So I don't know how many people actually uh, showed up, but it was 12 or 1,300. But this boy had every reason to not be happy. And um, what, what, what he did was he received the kingdom spiritually. He, re, he was receiving it as a child because he was a child. And he was living in the moment of visitation, yes. which later became habitation. Mm-hmm. And he's an example to all of us. And he said, I just want to dance like David danced, right? Or something like that. What did he say? <laughs> Brittany, we're singing, we're singing dance. dance. Yeah, and he just wanted to sit on Brittany's lap and be part of the band, and um, he was twirling. And I thought, you know what? You know, I don't want to make anyone feel bad that I went to heaven and got sent back. 
So I don't say anything to make anybody feel bad, but I'm telling you, once you've been there and you realize God's normal, you got to take it like a child. And we get very complicated. And what has happened in this generation is we, we have missed, we have, we, have, we have done everything to make it f- the formality, but we have lost the power. So the life has been squeezed out for the sake of getting to the end, even if we have to kill people spiritually to get there. So the bottom line is ministry has to do with love, and love is going to be a sacrifice. And if you don't count the cost, and if you don't love God, it's going to show by the fruit. So everything you do has to be motivated in love. And that's why Paul, knowing people, He paused in chapter 12 of Corinthians and he was writing to the spiritual bunch, the ones that were just crazy spiritual people, but they had no character. And he was talking about the spiritual gifts and he paused and wrote chapter 13, which everybody skips over because you want to get to the good stuff about prophecy in chapter 14. But it says... That even if you could speak the depths of revelation by the Spirit, if you don't have love, you're nothing. Now, if you prophesy the depths and you don't have love, you're nothing and you've gained nothing. Now, when I was on the other side, I saw all this. I saw that uh, there's an audit and you're not judged like the world's judged because you judged yourself. Hopefully you've done that. You've, you judge yourself every day, so you're not judged with the world, like Paul said to them. But he, he said in chapter 3, and this is after chapter 2. <laughs> chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians is talking about the spiritual person, about the ministry of the Spirit, that I hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, and even in, hasn't entered into your heart what God has for those who love him. But it has been revealed to us by his spirit. And the spirit searches the deep things of God. And he talks about how a spiritual person can judge things, but uh, a carnal person can't judge a spiritual person because they don't even understand the spirit. So if you don't have the spirit, you cannot judge spiritual things. So Paul goes through all that. And then he goes to chapter 3, which none of you know because you don't, you don't go there. But chapter 3, verse 1 says... I wish that I could address you as spiritual, but you are carnal. Mere babes, when you should be on meat, you're on milk. Meh. Babies. Okay, he just, he just said something profound as an apostle, but he said, you guys aren't included in on this. Well, this is the bunch that where there's lines for people to prophesy. The ones that have a tongue are here. The interpretations are here word of knowledge, word of wisdom, let it be several. Let's do it in order. If I'm speaking or someone's speaking, don't interrupt them because the Spirit's not going to do that, okay? It's just like, and don't, if Jesus, uh, if someone says Jesus is a curse, you know that's just not the Spirit. So judge everything. Okay, so the whole congregation is lining up to do all this, and you don't see that anymore in churches because you're not allowed. Okay, but Paul allowed it, but he said, please, you know, Here's some guidelines. Let's do lanes, and and let's do a two or three. Let it be done in order. And if you have a tongue, make sure that someone there has the gift of of interpretation of tongues so that if there's unbelievers there that don't know what you're doing, that that uh, they, they can participate. I would rather you prophesy, which would be in the known language there, that because, and desire those greater gifts. See, love is talking here because Paul is saying, listen, the Spirit doesn't want those who are, don't understand. If, if, if they hear this and they don't have an interpretation, and if people hear tongues but they don't have the, the, uh, the interpretation of it, it says it's, about, it's really about the body being built up. And so I'd rather you prophesy because then everybody can participate in what God's saying. And he's saying if, if you don't have the, the t- interpretation, just keep quiet. Okay, so he's not talking. He said he prayed in tongues more than you all. 
okay? He wasn't talking about your personal prayer language that you get when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the nine gifts of the Spirit, which is a different thing. So don't confuse it. In a public setting, under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, nine gifts, it's really the operation of love. So if you hear something from God in your known language, everyone, he said, can worship God and give praise because you're all built up. But he said, if you pray, if you pray in an unknown tongue, not say it in a public, when you pray in an unknown tongue, you're talking to God. And your mind is not fruitful and no one knows what you're saying because it's between you and God. You're praying and your mind is not fruitful, but another person, they're not understanding it either. So in a public setting, he said, I would rather you prophesy or have someone that can interpret the tongue. In other words, it's all based on love because it's not about if you're spiritual or not. because the Spirit of God can do fine without you if he just has your mouth. So it's more about yielding than it is building. And a lot of people are building. And the bottom line is our goal is not to push God into something he already wants to do. Our, God, our, our idea of God is wrong because he's not pushing us. And I'm not pushing him. And I'm not trying to convince him of anything that, that I want him to do. I will not succeed in convincing him of something because he's already predetermined the good works. I mean, if you want to bring Paul into it, all the good works that we were to do in Christ are already predetermined. In other words, the whole plan was made before we were even in existence. And Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world, according to the Bible. In the book of Revelation, Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. That's pretty early. And I don't think you were at that meeting the planning of it. And, you, and when God wrote a book about you in Psalms 139, you were not there at that meeting. You did not have any input in that. They had that meeting without you. They did not want your opinion. They still do not want your opinion about that. In other words, you didn't have input on where you were born, when you were born. But Acts 17 says that God knew every person would be on the earth and what generation they would be in. He knew every territory and his plan and his completeness. But Jesus said in Acts 1, if you compare it with the 17th chapter, it says that it is not for us to know the times and the seasons to interpret them. That is for the Father. It's reserved for the Father. But stay here because power from on high is good. Because the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. But the Holy Spirit will come upon you in power. You will receive power from on high. So that he says that in the same breath. He says it's not for us to understand and know the times and the seasons, but you shall receive power from on high. All in the same breath. This should be your template for life. So throw your end time DVDs away. <laughs> because the minute they come out, they're wrong. Because it will not happen any other way than the way Jesus said it. Jesus says, I don't know, the Holy Spirit doesn't know, and the angels don't know. He said, only the Father knows the return. How can you make that any different? How can anyone misunderstand that? If you couple that with what Jesus said on his extra 40 days after his resurrection, and he went around teaching, he said this. He said, that is not for us to interpret the times and the seasons as a reserve for the Father, but power shall come from on high and baptize you. That's what he said in the same breath. So that is the focus. That's God's normal. So I say this because if we don't operate in the way that God has said to operate, then we're not operating in the normal. And what will happen is, is you will become afraid of man and the fear of man is a snare, we know. And Jesus said, you should fear the one, not man. He said, you should fear the one that can throw your soul and your body in hell. But that doesn't go over well, and you end up preaching in a hotel. 
But what happens is, is that people come out just like they did with Jesus. They come out to the fields to hear the preacher man. They come out of the, the synagogue. They come out of the temple. And then the religious leaders chased him around and confronted him constantly. But he was God's normal, and he was a fulfillment of all the prophets that had prophesied. So he was right before them, and they conspired to kill him. To kill him. And when Lazarus was risen from the dead, they conspired to kill the evidence as well. Okay, you have to realize that these are the ones that were called Elohim. Ye are Elohim. You are the judges. You have been trusted with the word of God that was given by Moses. And Moses talked about me. The prophets prophesied about me. He said, and you want to kill me. And this is what he said. Now listen to me very carefully because this, this is where we push the thrust up the whole way. He said, why do you want to kill, kill me? And he said, because you claim to be the son of God. Now, he could have said, well, you have a problem with that? <laughs> but but what, what he, this is what he said. He said, I sent you. Now, listen to what, what he said. I sent you the prophets. And they spoke of me, okay? Abraham saw my day and rejoiced in it. You know, I can just keep on going. But the, the point is, is this, that there, there came this thing that he said that has changed my life because I met him. And he's just like this. He said, the ones I sent you, he said, you killed. Okay, he said, you killed the prophets, right? But then he said this, but now you celebrate them as your heroes. So if you don't understand yourself, If you feel displaced in any way, it's because you've encountered God's normal. Now listen, I feel, Br Brother Hagen told us in class, he said, I don't rejoice when, when people speak well of me, and I don't feel sad when people speak bad of me. He says, neither one of them are correct. He said, I am not excited when people like me, and I am not uh, sad or hurt or slow down in any way when people don't like me. And here's the thing that happened, and it's, it was arrested by what just happened. But what the goal was, was to try to, to match the world in our presentation. And the, the heart, the heart was that we would be accepted that way. That we would be more acceptable, more um, palatable. So what happens is, is you compromise. You compromise the message. Now, now, now stick with me. You compromise the message, and when you make it not as much where people are accountable, then what happens is they like you. But this is what happens. The offerings get bigger and the crowd gets bigger. The congregation gets bigger. And if you, you say God, but you don't mention Jesus, and you talk about heaven, but you don't mention hell, and you don't mention re repentance, and you don't talk about the blood, and you don't, certainly don't rebuke devils because that starts a, a circus and a sideshow, just like what Jesus, everything was fine in the synagogue until he was the guest speaker. It really happened. The man in the synagogue, he was speaking, and the, he was on the front row, and he was, he was on the board. His wife was the music minister, I'm sure, because she was good looking. And everything was fine, but Jesus shows up, and he, he starts to preach. And the man started manifesting. Everything was fine. Okay, so at that point, because of the compromise, the devil probably had popcorn and snacks and everything and was just, could sit through the whole message up until Jesus came. 
every, and they're like, oh, they're playing our favorite song. <laughs> because there was nothing confront of about anything that was happening in the service. And that, that they didn't know that man had what he had in him. Okay, so the temperature goes up. And so the people in the synagogue, like, you know, can you cool it down in here? They're like, we have it full blast. And so what happens is they take the God's normal that's speaking that morning, which is very abnormal to them now. Okay, that normal was the standard that we should have had all. They, 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 these are the people, their descendants are the ones that cover your face, Moses. We can't take it. He was fearful to look upon, but he didn't know it. But he had spent so much time with God that he started to look like him. And we're going to know that when you have spent enough time with God. We're going to start to see it. We're going to start to see it. That's what I saw at the end of this age. I saw that happening. And I saw people lined outside the doors wanting to get in. And they were early for the next service. These are the people that should have stewarded all of this. And the temperature was so, it wasn't even lukewarm, it was cold. So Jesus now, it appears that he's causing problems with the temperature. And now people are acting up. So he cast the devil out of the man. Now, automatically, leadership that has fallen behind has lost it. They've gone, they've gone rogue. And they're, they're just off a couple of degrees, but in a three-hour flight, they've missed the whole state and the country. And now, and this is just one degree at a time, but over time, it starts diverting. And that's why I have Lou flying with me. <laughs> because it turns into a bigger problem. So anybody that would stand up and say, you know what, we're off a little bit. Oh, we, you know, we don't, we're, we're walking in love. We don't criticize. It's like, is this isn't criticism. This is like, and, and after a while, they get rid of people that say, you know what? I just don't feel right about what we're doing here. Why are we always taking offerings? Do we always have to take offerings? And so you start saying stuff like that. And so, so a whole generation is accountable, but each time God sends somebody to say something that people don't listen and then they go into the desert like the United States is in the desert now because people didn't listen and it didn't have to happen but it's like think about it. we're bracing for whatever's going to happen next or whatever's going to come out of our leader's mouth next if we can understand it <laughs> So, does anybody know how to interpret this? <laughs> Never mind, because it'll probably cost us $33 billion. So, everything's itemized now. Okay, so, getting back on track, God's normal essentially brings us back to the true. But the people that bring that news are not liked if you're messing with the system. So if you start jimmying with the system, if you go back there and say, listen, you, you Pharisees, you're back there inspecting on the tables, you're inspecting the lambs, and you're saying they've got blemishes. So yeah, but we got some good ones. So you sell them the good one so they can do their sacrifice. And then the money that they had to pay, they were doing the money changing. But it was corrupt, so it wasn't, it wasn't true balances. So they were ripping the people off. So this is what was going on. And I don't know if you've done the, the, the in-depth study of this, but they essentially were holding those lambs and all those doves and stuff that were not acceptable and then reselling them to the next person. Saying, no, this one's, but we got one here. They're just putting white out or something. I don't know what they're doing <laughs> on the market. 
But that's what, that's what I, I found, because I was trying to figure this out and, and do some research. And you can do this too, you can do this too. And then you can call yourself a scholar. You know, and write yourself a little certificate, you know. But anyway, a, anyway, God's normal. Essentially, God wants to send people in a generation with, to keep us on track. So the, the true gospel has already been described by Jesus at the beginning when he read the scroll in the synagogue. He, wrote, he read what the prophet spoke about him. And it said what he was to do, okay? Who, who, what his purpose was and everything. And then at the end, in Mark 16, and if you don't believe that's in the Bible, then just go to Matthew 28, you know, and, if it, and just don't read the nearly inspired version because they took it out. But if you, if you read, it's, it's the same thing. Here's what will happen, at, and you're going to do it. So he hands it off. He reads the scroll. And they all look at him. And he's reading it. And then he goes, and this is fulfilled in your midst. You know? They're like, what did he just say? He goes, did he just say he's it? Okay, but at, at the end of it, he says, you're it. And he tags you and he runs. You're it. He did. And he gave us the same assignment that he had read from the scroll. Okay, that is, is that we are to have preached good news. Good news to the poor. What is good news? Well, it was jubilee, and it's that was debt, debt forgiveness. So he preached good news to the sick. What was that? You don't have to be sick anymore. Okay? You have to just use your six-year-old's brain. Don't try to overcomplicate it. What would be good news to someone's in debt? What's good news for someone who's sick? What's good news for someone who's bound? Is you don't have to be bound anymore. So if you read what is prophesied about Jesus and then what the fulfillment was and what he did, he went around doing good and healing everyone. Did I mention everyone? You know what it says in the Greek? Everyone. Okay. <laughs> everyone that was, even says how it, orig, it was origin, originated by the devil. It says all that were oppressed of the devil. So he was healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So he, he slides a whole bunch of information in there. And then at the end of the age, he says, now you, you, you preach the good news and you heal the sick and you cast out devils and you raise the dead. As though raising the dead is harder than casting a devil out or healing the sick. But it isn't because he said it all in the same. And, you know, it's, it takes the size of a, of a, of a mustard seed for faith and every one of us has been given a portion of faith. So I think you're out of excuses. Like as far as like if you're going to work this up. So God's normal is that he likes to add on to what he has established previously with pulling back the veil further. Okay, so when Paul comes, this was, this was curtain number, this was number three. I, on, on your show, let's make a deal. I, would you like what's behind or whatever it was called? But it's the last curtain. G, Paul said it. There, he said, this is a hidden, there's a mystery and it's been hidden for ages past. He said, but now it has been revealed to us and that is Christ in us. Yeah. Hope of glory. And he talks about this mystery and he reveals the whole thing and it's a done deal. This is it. There, this is the mystery. There is no deep mysteries beyond Christ in you, the hope of glory. At the end of his life, before he, he, he died in Rome, he said, this is the only thing that I, I, I learned in my whole life. He said, it's Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's it. After being, a, after being a, a, on the road to a head Pharisee under Gamaliel, he was the next in line. He was being groomed. He was killing Christians to try to get enough brownie points, extra credit for his graduation. He was trying to show all them that he was zealous. He was working against God the whole time. Okay, when he encountered Jesus on the road of Damascus, he encountered God's normal. He encountered God's normal.
he walked away from there and disappeared for many years. And he went to the mountain of God. And he, he encountered Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, according to him, taught him his message. His, he called it his gospel. So this became Paul's normal. He encountered something supernatural. And it changed him, but it changed everything. Even his message and his perception. And he disappeared and he, he bragged. He said, I have been taught by any man. I received this verbatim from Jesus Christ himself. Okay, so that, this person now, he changes the world. Everywhere he goes, they want to make him a god or they want to kill him. And there's no in-between. They literally wanted to make him a god in one place. And then they were going to kill him in another place. Okay, this is like with Jesus. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're throwing palm branches down. That the very next day, it says, they took him to the brow of the hill to throw him off. What happened in one page of your Bible? Well, if you can answer that, then, then, then there's another question. Because in, on one page of your Bible... Jesus asked Peter, who, who do you say that I am? He said, well, you're the, the son of God. You're the Messiah, the son of God. He said, this has not been revealed to you by man. This has been revealed to you by my father himself. Okay. Flip your page over, one page. And Jesus said, I have to tell you, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. And on the third day, I'm going to be raised from the dead. And all Peter said was no. Because we made a reservation at that restaurant at the Lake of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee. No, he said no. I've, and what did Jesus say? What, he said, get behind me. He, in other words, in Greek, he said, you're in my way. So I'm about to plow you over. So step aside and get behind me, Satan. He's speaking to Satan. Now, why? Because all of a sudden, what Jesus heard was against his mission. So Peter was now in the way as well. But Peter was a prophet the day before. And now he's speaking in the name of Satan the next day. One page, okay? So you get it? This is, this is human, humanity at its best, okay? This is what you deal with every day. It's a flip-flop. It's not what you put on your feet. It's a fish out of water. In other words, it's like the weather in New Orleans. If you don't like it, just wait an hour. Why? Because things change. Why? Because there's atmospheres and environments down here that, that have to do with these evil spirits. And they have intertwined themselves with people's emotions. And what... They think, well, it's just me. This is my thing. This is just, and then people say, oh, that's just, that's just Amelia. That's the way she is. It's like, no, that's not Amelia. Because if you deal with the devil, then all of a sudden she changes. Her personality started to become like the demonic that was influencing her, but nobody could know it because the temperature wasn't hot enough. Okay, so churches, churches should have this atmosphere where you don't have to do anything except what you're called to do as, as the church, which is to preach the gospel, period. See, the devils know if you're preaching the gospel, and they know they got to go. If they don't think they got to go, it's because it's not being preached. Okay, there might be something being spoken there. But the thermostat is not set on where you're going. You see, there's a thermometer that tells you the real thing. So that's the real temperature, thermometer. But I don't change the thermometer. If I want the temperature to change, I have to place a demand on the dial, which is a thermostat. It's not a thermometer. I can't set it on 72 if it is 72 and expect anything to change. Now, hear me out. Are, are you a thermometer Christian or are you a thermostat Christian? Because a thermostat Christian places a demand 
on where you're going. And that's what Jesus did all the time. Now, if, if he had come and everybody was where they needed to be, he would have just been accepted and things would have been totally different. But see, God's plan was that man had fallen and they're not going to get it. John said Jesus didn't commit himself to anybody because he knew what was in a man. In other words, he knew that everyone would throw him under the bus. Everyone would sell him out at a certain point to preserve themselves. That is what is in every one of us. Everybody has a sellout point. It is, it is really an amazing thing for someone to die for a friend. It is an amazing thing for somebody to die for someone else. Because it means complete selflessness. So most of the time, we encounter God in a thermometer state instead of a thermostat state. Because a thermostat would set where we're going and to place a demand on the system. And what we're doing is we're just kind of meshing with what's going on which means we become part of the problem. And this happens all the time. And that's why every generation has voices that speak from the other realm. And then we have repentance, brokenness, forgiveness, healing, deliverance, and then we have a move of God. But it should not oscillate like that. Now, you've seen the F-22 flying around. You know, maybe not here as much because this is naval, but they have the F-22. But when that was in its first um, uh, stages, they, they have what they call fly-by-wire system. So this is, this is more of like what the F-16 has. It's a sense on, on, the, on the stick. They actually, it didn't move at first. They had to because the pilots didn't feel anything, so they wanted some movement. But it's really cosmetic because it feels the pressure and the grip that you place on it. And then it tells the controls what, what the pilot is intending. It's interpreting the pressure. Okay? So it's an electric jet. So if you have a failure that's, they have redundancy so that they have computers placed in different places on these jets now. So that if something happens, you've got backups. But literally on the checklist, if they off, off, you have a complete failure, the only thing on the checklist is eject because the plane cannot fly without the computers. It's a, it's a complete failure. So with the F-22, if you look at the films, you can look it up. I'm sure it's going to go up to a million views after I say this, but <laughs> the, essentially they took off, and then um, he was trying to correct. It, actually, it, it wasn't even supposed to take off. The test was a taxi test, but it went too, uh, went too fast, I believe, and it, it actually went airborne. And um, there's also other films with this too, but it went into what they call PIO. What that is is the pilot said, okay, I want it to go up, so he went like this, but it's so fast, and it was in his, he overcorrected, so he was like already telling the nose to go down, but it was way behind. So it was actually oscillating like this and crashed because it was better than the pilot. So he was like riding way behind trying to correct it and just go like this. And it looked like a, like, like a, you know, porpoise, you know, <laughs> flipper. Except it was a couple billion dollar flipper. It was a hundred billion dollar flipper. Whatever they are, 200 million, whatever they are. They, the, the bottom line is that you can't handle operating in the flesh down here. You cannot, you can manipulate and you can control, but you cannot, like you can do it in a corporate way where you put your thumb on people and you say, you gotta live right or you're not gonna be in the choir. And you can like say, you, you gotta, gotta tithe or God's not gonna bless you. And you can do all this stuff and control people and you can keep enough information from them like the government does just so that you stay stupid. So they make the manual for, for tax, the tax law so big you won't, and the health care, 1,000 pages. That's all so that you won't be in the know. 
okay, well, you can't, you can't be a leader in the church and make the Bible hard. If people with a third edu- grade education level who are farmers in the Bible that Jesus preached to, if they got it, then why would it be even more complicated now that we're getting into the Greek? In other words, like how, 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 how uh, complicated has it become? And now you got people that are waiting to be good enough to become a Christian. Or whatever, you know, like whatever. Or they, if something bad happens, people don't know how to to process that, that did to deal with discrepancies in an emergency. So people don't know how to deal with the fact that Psalms 91 was always true, and that no disease can come near you. You will watch thousands of people die. It says, but it will not come near you. That was given to Moses. If you look, it was written by Moses on the mount. 90 and 91 of Psalms were written by Moses. And Moses had the revelation when God walked by and revealed himself. He goes, man, there is no way that any evil could dwell here. There is no disease that could survive. And so he wrote Psalms 91 from that cleft of that rock. I'm not kidding you. He was fully convinced and he said, but it's those who make the most high their dwelling place. Well, everybody's been doing the drive through until something happens and it tests the covenant that was made in Psalms 91. And so for the last two years, I've been in Psalms 91 every day and it never came near me, but I saw people fall, a thousand and 10,000 at my right hand, but it shall not come near me. And it didn't. Okay. That is not because I'm good or that I went to heaven. It was because I opened my insurance policy every day. And I went over the terms. And I just reminded that foul disease that I'm not participating in this. I'm just telling you, it's not because I'm better. Uh, Listen, I've had my health issues by flying for 30 years on an airline where they were using all kinds of chemicals and stuff to clean the airplane. They were, they were gassing the airplane for fleas and all this lice, lice and stuff that, you know, and I, I, I get, the, get the car ready. I'm going to have to get out of here. Right. <laughs> the men in black are going to come. But I was, I was constantly having ear problems and nasal problems and immune problems. It was amazing. As soon as I retired, it all went away. And our airplanes, I have no problem. But we don't sit back there with a can of Raid every flight. <laughs> I'm serious. The, and the cleansers are like, I think that's how the dinosaurs disappeared. <laughs> it was those cleansers. Okay, so you understand, you understand that the age we live in, because, because we don't weather well, it's because the temperature has been slowly going down. And if this happened, just because I want to get into my lesson here, because I have to at least open the study guide. But I'm building up to it because it's very important at this first night that you are on the same page, is that essentially, essentially uh, Jesus was at a certain clip uh, of, of time, and he had a ministry of three and a half years, and he had uh, 33 years or whatever, don't argue with me, and, and yes, the earth is round, so don't argue me about that. But, but, you know, you have 33 years and people argue with that. But, you know, when Paul came along, Paul was alive when Jesus was alive. But, but he didn't really encounter Jesus until the road of Damascus. Okay, but he was alive, okay? And John, of course, you know, was with him. Okay, so... Let's, let's, let's really be mature about this, just to show you how we are and how a broken world works. If you leave yourself alone, you're going you're gonna to mess up, and you're going to mess it up for everybody. If we're left alone, if you don't have a police officer with a radar gun, you're going to mess up. You, you have to have that deterrent, but it's not just for you. It's for the mom in the minivan that turns around to tell her kids to be quiet and goes through a red light. Okay, so your speed, even though it's a green light, you you cut it in half through an intersection because you don't know if a mom is coming 
through there, and she's dealing with two kids that are throwing Fruit Loops at her. So you go, you, you go 15 miles an hour instead of your 30. See, it's, you shouldn't have to have a police officer sitting there to tell you this, but this is the way human beings are. They have to have boundaries. We have to have laws. We have to have the, these, these, these uh, deterrents that cause people to do the right thing. But if we walked in love, we wouldn't need policemen because we would be thinking of others. And that's what Jesus said. You want to fulfill the whole law, just love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Three things. Love yourself, love your neighbor, and love God. Three things. And most people don't do any of them. And uh, the people that think they are and aren't, those are the hardest ones. That's the religious bunch because they think they're doing. Like the rich young ruler thought, he, he said, I've been perfect since birth. He's telling the Son of God that. And it says that Jesus just looked at him and loved him because he goes, this guy. Because he's just like one small thing. He was gentle with them. We wouldn't have been. We wouldn't have been. Okay, so getting back. John encounters Jesus on the Alpatmos. Okay? Now, it's only been like 30 years. Now, think about this. Jesus has only been away. Paul, Paul, the apostle is alive. Okay, if you look at the Colossians, if you look in the original, Colossians is also, if you look, it's even in the text, but at the top in some manuscripts, it says to Laodicea. Okay, so the Laodicean church is one of the seven churches that Jesus said, please write to these people. And he tell, you know, it's amazing that Jesus brought correction to the Laodicean church. They've all been written to by Paul. And they have to be told they're naked. They have to be told they're poor. And they have to be told they're blind. Because they think they can see. They think that they, they, they have nice clothes and well-fed. And, and um, they're rich. So Jesus has to come and tell them that, and, and think about this, these churches are gone. But Paul wrote Colossians to them, okay? So you ought to read Colossians. So they got all of that, and, and these churches, they're told they're lukewarm. So what happened in 30 years? Just 30 years. This is human behavior. If we're left to ourselves, we migrate. That's why, that's why the way that things are taught is to keep the word of God before you and to pray in the spirit and build yourself up and keep the word of God before you and prophesy from your spirit. Speak out from your spirit and call the things that are not as though they were to speak the things, because the Spirit, according to Jesus, if you want to bring him into it, the Spirit does these things. He is going to lead you into all truth because he is the Spirit of truth. That's his gig. His gig is truth. He is truth. He leads you into truth. Okay? That means that, that that's the right path, but that's the perfect will of God. Okay, so he, he is truth. He reveals truth. He leads you into truth. The second thing he does is remind you of things that Jesus had said. This is from the Son of God, so don't get mad at me. And he also said to show you things to come, to reveal to you the future. Okay, these are the main things. So now, there is his role as a defender and an advocate and a counselor and all that. But I'm, for, for purposes, of God is wanting us to see that left to ourselves, we digress. And if you leave something go, your house does not clean itself. Your room does not clean itself. You know, things don't get replenished. It goes to disorder. Everything, if left to itself, it defaults not to order, but disorder. It deteriorates. Okay? So the Lord wants us to build upon 
what he has spoken. But there is no new revelation in the sense of the mystery has been revealed. It's Christ in us. If we get that, we're going to get everything. But we haven't got that because the gospel is offensive in its purest form. So if you start to talk about the blood of Jesus and you start to talk about the name of Jesus, you don't mention God. See, your, your, your 60,000 people will go to a small Bible study. If you start to talk about those powerful words about brokenness and repentance and about humility and I'm talking about the blood of Jesus, any demonic force that's present will, will vacate but it will look as though you're causing trouble. And the other thing that happens is, is just like the person that came to you and said, um, hey, there's this stock. It's called Wall something, Walmart or something. It's like, it's like three bucks. I'm going to buy something. You're going to buy some. Oh, no, I don't do that. Well, I felt like the Lord was telling me to buy it. So they go ahead and buy it. And now they're flying and you're walking. <laughs> okay, so what happens if that happens with Cisco, happens with Microsoft, now Twitter? <laughs> and you know, like, in other words, like at what point, at what point do you start to own it and say, I'm going to pray? In other words, when do you get in sync is God do in other words, owning your own relationship with God, owning your finances, owning your health, owning everything about you, and then owning your neighbor. And wanting to help them too as well. In other words, believe God for others and, and help them. Okay. This is where God's normal nudges you into the next step, which is the bride of Christ being readied for their departure, the, the wedding. But before that happens, there is a huge harvest that has to come in. Amen. <laughs> what she said was, go ahead and start your lesson. <laughs> so we're going to turn to chapter two in your study guide, because I just did chapter one for you. And chapter two is on page 39. Now, here's uh, can I just show you something that just happened recently that probably nobody even caught? It just happened in the church in the last 10 years. And nobody caught it. Maybe somebody did. You know, maybe people did. I don't know. But um, Peter, the one that had the foot in the mouth disease, he, he got delivered. And now his shadow is healing people. When Actually, when his shadow touched somebody, they ran. They used to run. Peter was not the kind of guy you hung out with. You know, one day he's wielding a sword, and the next day, you know, he's, you know, he's just, um, he's, he just gets set off in any direction. He's a bottle rocket. You know, he just, no, no, no rudder, no directional control, just a lot of thrust, you know, <laughs> bottle rocket, you know. So this is this is really the, the, where we start this, this, this weekend is right here. But you build up to it because that's what God does. He builds up to it. He pulls back curtains and shows you things, but it's really done. The mystery has been revealed because it has entered into our heart because it says it has been revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. It says, eye has not seen, ear has not heard. What God has never entered in the man, heart of man what God has for those that he loves. Then it we forget that there's another verse. It says, but it has been revealed to us by his spirit. And then it goes into the spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. So if you really want to hook up with the deep things of God, you got to get the tour guide that's going to take you there, which is the only person you have on the earth right now is the Holy Spirit. And he is the master at his own realm. He is the master of the spirit realm. Why would we not want more of him? We've been given all of him, but why would we not just go ahead? If Paul said, when you pray in the spirit, you're not praying to man, you're praying to God. And then in, he told the Romans in eight, chapter 8, 26, verse 26, he said, when in your weakness, when you don't know how to pray, 
the Spirit comes in and lifts you up and super intercedes for you on behalf of God's perfect will. Well, what a deal is that? And it says that you will pray out the perfect will of God and you won't understand what you're saying. No, why would people spend three hours arguing with you instead of saying, I'll take it? That's a great deal. Because if they couple that with James, I mean, if they know the Bible, James said that the rudder of your life is your tongue. Well, so the Holy Spirit grabs your tongue and prays out the mysteries. What a great deal. So it, it's huge that the Holy Spirit, when he came, he was outpoured, he grabbed their tongue, which is their rudder. Do you follow me? Jesus said, speak to your mountains. Well, can you imagine if that's propelled? Your words are propelled by the Spirit. I mean, th th that's a done deal. It's not shotgun faith. Just aim in the general direction. With a shotgun, you can hit anything. No, this is, this is precision sniper shot. One shot, one kill. This is, this is, I'm going to hit it. I don't need my second round. A sniper never thinks he's going to miss. He's surprised when he misses. Why? Because he is trained to do that. We can be trained that way if we hook up with the one who is the master at the spirit realm, which is the Holy Spirit. Okay, so this is what Peter says. You know, sorry to bring the Bible into it, but I got to because you got, you, we got to click it up. We're, we're, way, we're way off, and this is... We heard... We... I mean, I, I heard that you got to build your faith. And I heard it and heard it and heard it. I did everything to build my faith. And I neglected my love walk. And I thought that that verse, I was so surprised when I, that the verse that says, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. I thought it said, but the greatest of these is faith. I couldn't believe it. It said the greatest of these is love. Because I had heard about faith and building your faith until I expected mountains to move. But if I don't have love, I have nothing. And that's what I got. <laughs> if we were honest with ourselves, but see, we don't do this. We don't judge ourselves. Because we don't want anybody to know that we're, that we're not really as, doing as well as we, we are. Okay, so, and this is where ministers get into a trap. They get isolated, and who are they going to turn to? Because everybody puts them up on a pedestal, which is El Rongo. I mean, you don't understand what that means? I mean, I go to countries, they know exactly what I mean. Okay, so 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, it says, So, devote yourselves. What, is a de what does devote mean? It means like, you know, put it all in and, and let's get this done. In other words, like, you're not like, I don't enter into something and look for the exits, the exits points, you know, if it doesn't work out. If I'm going to set my heart to something that I know is righteous and holy, then I know I got it. I don't have to ask God for something like that because I know I got it. And there's so many of you that are praying for things that you don't need to pray for. You need to start casting devils out and get rid of your familiar spirits because that's what's happened. And you're in a war and you don't know it. And they're so happy that you don't know it because the minute you know it, they're going to blow it. They're going to they're gonna blow town. Okay. Anyway, that's, way, that's like tomorrow night, so. Okay. All right, so it says, devote yourselves to lavishly, I mean like overabundance, supplementing, which is you have something and you add to it. Supplementing, it's a supplement. So it's, it's above and beyond what you already have. So you got to have this mindset because you're going to get this. Because this is what's happened in the last 10 years. A transition has happened, and God has moved on to the greater things. And we are still trying to master our faith. 
Okay, so this is what happened. It said, supplement your faith. Okay, so, wait a minute. I just spent the last 20 years building my faith, and now it's like, okay, now that's the foundation, and now I'm going to build? you got to be kidding me. I spent 20 years on the foundation, and I only got the footers, and the last cement truck just left. That's it. That's all I got in 20 years. Peter says, supplement your faith with these. I'm like, oh, there's more? The greatest of these is not faith. It's love. Faith worketh through love. Okay. I get kind of nervous when I preach on love because all my generals, that was their last sermon they preached before they passed away. <laughs> I'm serious. Everyone, if you look, every, every one of them, that was their, I mean, you can go. I'm <laughs> I heard even John, you know, like John, John says, love one another. You know, that was his last sermon. Okay, so. <laughs> All right, so, you're, you, you know, faith. Okay, so if we're going to make a movement out of the next thing, because we've done that with everything, you know, somebody gets healed, we call it a healing movement. Then somebody uh, moves a mountain, and we call it the faith movement. And he, somebody says they're an apostle, prints out their certificate online, and then we have the apostolic movement. And then we ha have the prophetic movement because somebody actually got something right, and then they get a certificate, and then another a prophet. So then you have that, all right? So then you have the pathetic movement that comes after the prophetic movement. So, so you, have, you have these that you have to add. So let's make these movements. All right, so the, I'm going to add to my faith, goodness. So goodness is like after faith. This goes over well. And so then you end up at a hotel. Because I'm going to talk about the goodness of God, okay? So God is a good God. All right, so he, he Jesus only did what his father was doing. And Jesus only said what his father was saying. He said that. I don't speak on my own. He said, I'm going to send the Spirit after me. He's not going to speak on his own. He's only going to say what the father say. Okay, so he went around doing good, it says in Acts 10.38. He went around doing good and healing everyone who's oppressed the devil. So there is a pathway to healing. There is that ability. However, there's all these things that you have to deal with down here in a broken world. And so there's a fight for that. And if you've been disobedient, you end up in a bad way about things. And then you just throw it to God and, and say, fix it. And I've had students do that. They get the airplane to, you know, they always say, take the student three mistakes high. So you take them up to an altitude, they can make three mistakes and you still live. So we call it three mistakes high. So you take a student up three mistakes high so that if you blow through all of them, you can still recover the aircraft. But I've had students like get it so, then they hand it back to you. And so you're supposed to fix it now. And so you have to be trained to do that. You have to tr be trained if it's thrown back to you that you can fix it, okay? So Peter is giving us instruction because I'm just gonna go, like, like I'm at point A to point B. And um, I try to get rid of the drama in between. Because between point A and point B, according to most people, there's just drama. But see, to me, I'm just going to point B. But when people enter an aircraft, they have three carry-ons when they're supposed to have one. They have alcohol and they're not supposed to have none. They're not supposed to give me a lip. They're supposed to zip their lip and have a seat. <laughs> Buckle up, buddy. But, so I'm like, I'm like, I'm paid from A to B. 
um, to ensure safety A to B. And, you know, drama is not even optional with me, but of course down here, it's just not going to happen. I just can't imagine Moses, you know, managing four and a half million people and Noah, all the animals and the people, <laughs> you know, for a year, you know. I mean, we still have it good. But the, thi the thing of it is, is that God says, okay, you want to end up like this or you want to end up here. Okay, here's the straight line. It's up to you if you want to do anything else. Because he's just an A to B person. Now, the journey in between can be favorable and you can do what you can to, to make that happen. But there's a lot of times we're kicking and screaming through that. And we're not cooperating and others are not. And you suffer because of other people's disobedience. So here he's saying, listen, He's saying right now to us, okay, we had the healing movement. We had the faith movement. Now we're going to have the goodness movement. Yeah. <laughs> and so Oral Roberts was with the Episcopal Church, and he announced that God was a good God, and they kicked him out. So now he's in a tent. But his God was healing people, and theirs was not. Well, it's because the Messiah that came was coming not to kill, steal, and destroy. He said, I'm coming to give you life and life more abundantly. He, he defined it. Okay, so he went around doing good and healing. Everyone was oppressed to the devil. But it was outside the buildings. But it wasn't intended. It was supposed to be for everybody. Everybody was supposed to go up on the mountain. You can read it. But, you know, they said they threw Moses under the bus. They were afraid, so they said, you go up, it's fine. Whatever he says, we'll do. So we're going to build a calf out of the gold we stole, and we're going to worship it. No, but that's what they did. Okay, left to themselves, they reverted right back to their, the pagan ways that they were exposed to in a foreign land. Come on now. And they were God's people. Okay? Jesus has to appear to John 30 years later and correct the Laodiceans and all the other churches in Turkey, in northern Turkey. And it, it didn't take long, did it? Okay, so it says, add to your faith. Okay, what could be greater than faith? Goodness, then from the goodness, understanding or wisdom. And then to that strength of self-control. Well, that goes over well to tell somebody they got to like, like to give, to make people accountable that's how you turn your mega church into a small Bible study. Yeah. Is because whatever was compromised, you're going to have to pay back. So whatever you did to get it there, if you're called to account, then you have to bring it back to the standard. And as a leader, you're responsible for the people you've been assigned to. So you have to teach them how to drive out devils. Because it's part of the gospel. So why does it disappear? Some of these things disappear. Because the demonic influence in a generation pulls the people away from what hurts them and stops them. So that they can sit in the front row with popcorn. And the, the, the worship team's playing their favorite song. And they love the light show and the smoke machine. And they love the cold snack that they're getting. But they're not getting a hot meal. And the glory cloud hasn't come in in years. It's been Ichabod, so they have to create one. Come on now. Eli was responsible. Eli was responsible. His sons, he let his sons bring women in. They were priests. Eli let it happen. So when the prophet came in and announced Ichabod, he fell backwards and broke his neck. That's not a good Sunday school message. But see, either is Ananias and Sapphira. In the New Testament, New Testament, New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit. Ananias went to the first service, the 8 o'clock service. Sapphira went to the 11. (laughs) 
Nobody messaged her. Nobody called her. She had both cell phones on. Nobody warned her. <laughs> Pastor Peter did not warn her or help her at all or help him. Is this what you paid for it? I would have said, be careful of your answer. <coughs> Nothing. No help. The same men that carried your husband are going to carry you out. Bam. This is, this is after the offering and the baby dedication and the new membership. Okay, it says a great fear came upon the church and the fear of God came upon the church and the city. Okay, well, don't you think that should have been there already? Okay, so you get it, right? You're getting this? Okay, so the God's normal comes in, and it's really just a reintroduction of who he is, which includes his word and his spirit again. So we call it a move. We call it revival. We call it all these things. But what it really is is that one brave person who everybody considers an enemy of, of the system, if you're going to mess with their offerings, if you're going to mess with everything that's going on, if you're going to mess with that, this is the way we do things. Oh, really? Well, I want to do a reverse offering. Okay, so Jesus started back there because he said, this is a house of God. He was quoting the prophet, a house of prayer. But you've made it a den of thieves. And he flipped the tables over, not because it was a book table, They were, they were ripping off the church people. Do I need to go back over all this again? Because this is really going to be tiring if I have to start over again. Okay, first there was the dinosaurs. Then they died. <laughs> Do I have to go back? Listen to me. The only way that you're going to overcome the demonic is you got to turn the temperature up. And for 10 years... The shift is coming to where the Lord is saying, listen, you got the faith down. Now let's talk about the goodness of God and the understanding, the wisdom. Like Paul prayed, he said he prayed that the eyes of their heart would be enlightened, that they'd be flooded with light of revelation in the knowledge of him. That's what he prayed to the Ephesians in chapter 1, verse 17. And he prayed, continued to verse 23. And he asked them to receive this revelation light from the Spirit of God that would flood their, their eyes of their heart that they would be open. And then he said that they would know the hope to which they've been called and the glorious inheritance that's in the saints. So you have hope that's, that you don't know about and you have an inheritance you don't know about because Paul's praying for them to get it. Okay, then he said, and then it, you would, would understand the power that rose Jesus from the dead that's dwelling in you. This is the Apostle Paul praying for the church at Ephesus, who, by the way, in the book of Acts, they knew the spirit realm because over $50,000 at that time worth of spell books were burnt when that city repented. Did I mention repentance? They turned from their wicked ways. Okay, so Paul is still praying for them that the eyes of their heart would be enlightened with God's light and that they would know the hope to which they've been called to and the inheritance they have in the saints and the power that rose Jesus from the dead that's dwelling in them. That's what the Apostle Paul prayed. Okay, so we have understanding and we need to ask for more. So once we have that, it says add self-control, which would be, to me, an automatic if you've gotten through these stages, you're on your way to passing your test and being qualified because many are called, but few are chosen. And if you saw how narrow the way is, if you saw how hard it is to fit through the narrow way, because every, even on keto, <laughs> you can't make your head small enough. It, it, it ends up that you... You go into keto and you feed your faith all your life and your head is still too big and you won't fit through the narrow way because it's your head. It's the area of your head that you do not enter in. It's your head that keeps you out of the promised land. Now, I'm not talking about keeping you out of heaven 
as a Christian. I'm talking about you do not partake in the divine nature, which later Paul Peter says, which that'll get you kicked out of church. If you quote the Bible in church, you will get kicked out because it's <laughs> Peter says that we can escape the corruption that's in the world through these precious promises. He just he's talking about this first. I'm just giving you this first because you need this plate first. And I'm going to give you the second course. And I'm going I'm going to dish this out. But he said at the end, he said that through these precious promises, talking about what he just talked about, that we can be partakers of the divine nature and escape the corruption that's in the world caused by lust. Can't even say that word in church, but everybody's got a problem with it. Which is, which is why they don't talk about your immune system during a disease. Because that is what it, God created to keep you. And you've been compromised. So you become a permanent customer and then they get you in the debt and you become a permanent customer. Do I need to go on? And then they get you in the fear and then you're buying insurance for your toenails. You know? <laughs> when the angels are supposed to keep your toenails from being stubbed on a stone, you know? But you got to buy insurance because that, it, you, go, you keep backing out and you're a, ther a thermometer Christian instead of a thermostat Christian. You need to set the temperature and place a demand on this generation. And I'm telling you, they, they'll, they'll, they'll celebrate you when you're dead. You'll be a hero. But I want to guarantee you that Smith Wigglesworth was not invited to many churches. And neither was John G. Lake. He had to start his own. They all had to start their own thing. They were not heroes when they lived. Come on. You're all looking at me. No, you have to understand, Jesus said it. He says, you want to kill me. I sent you the prophets. They're your heroes now, but you killed them. And you're going to do the same to me. That's what he said. He says, you're going to do the same to me. And now J Jesus is celebrated as a savior, but how many partake of it? So it's not just a, it's just not a, a holiday. And I don't even think he had an Easter egg hunt. <laughs> I think he was busy doing other things. Like beating the living daylights out of the devil in the heart of the earth. Okay, but you know, I don't think he had time for an Easter egg hunt. Okay. I don't think there was any rabbits in the area. Okay, but... Okay, so he's saying self-control and then patient endurance and then godliness... Okay, so he's, these, these are ladders. This is a ladder of succession. So he's saying godliness. And you're like, well, wait a minute. I thought I was godly. These are virtues that you add. Okay, so then you think that that's the end of it. And so you make a movement out of the holiness movement, a godly movement. And then you... you he says, no, add mercy toward your brothers <laughs> and sisters. And then after you do that, it says one more thing. You're not going to believe what it is. The greatest of these. Add to that mercy unending love toward others. Since, now this is the promise, and this is the point B, without the drama, this is where I'm going. But I got a busload of people that are really into the journey and not where we're going. So if something's not happened, they have to make something happen. Since these virtues are already planted deep within you, uh-oh, uh-oh, wait a minute. I had him the whole time. And you're waiting for the move. The move of God. Okay. Already planted within you. And you possess them in abundant supply. Oh, gee. Okay. So this is where, this is where the discrepancy, the discrepancy in the data, you have to blame it on someone else. 
So you're going to have to like push it off and say, well, it's because of my parents. It's because of my church. And you, you, you don't want to own it. And what happens is Peter's saying that these virtues are already deep within you and they're in abundant supply. So you can't say, well, I'm you know, kind of low. And you can't say, you know, I'm looking for it. When God moves, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be with, right there with him. Well, they're already planted within you and it's abundant. I mean, if you want to bring the Bible into it, see, but th- th- this is the thing that, that was really frustrating to me is I didn't want to be in ministry because I knew if I was in ministry because I'm black and white with things and I'm point A to point B. And like, you know, I will pay people if they'll just leave drama at home. I would actually pay people. Like, in fact, I'll pay them to stay home. Like, I was like, in other words, like, if, if I know certain people are involved, I'm going to a high fat diet because I'm going to be burning calories. I'm going to be burning all kinds of, of stuff to deal with this. It's going to be, and the whole thing to me is, is it's really real to people. And, you, and I'm, not, I'm not talking about like what you're going through now. And I'm not talking about, you know, health problems and relationship problems and the demonic. I'm not making fun of anybody in here. What I'm saying is this. I'm talking about people that have to have attention. Whether it's negative or positive, they're going to get attention. Okay? If something's not happening, they're going to make it happen. But it's got to be so that the attention is on them. Okay? So in any generation, if a person will call people on it, like if you call somebody on it, your life is going to be very short. (laughs) If you start to like say... Did you ever notice how long it takes for a man to get ready? If you start down that route, you're, you're, you're dead. You're, you're, it's not going to be long. Like, like, you don't talk about certain things. I saw a quote where it says, it has been found that women live longer than men that mention about being overweight. The women, the women that they're talking about live longer than the men do. Because you just don't, you don't say those things if you want to live. I don't pull up to a cop and say, hey, you were speeding. Hey, buddy, click her down a notch, man. I, like, this guy passes me. I, I run up to the cop and I say, hey, slow down. You in a hurry? No, I don't tell him. Hey. It's 45, buddy. I clocked you at 52. (laughs) No, you just don't go there with certain things, okay? So if you start to say, listen, the Bible says that all these things are already in you and in abundant supply, well, then what you've done is you've you've completely ruined the drama gig. Because I'm finding out that people don't want to change. They just want sympathy. Yeah, and so what you're doing is you're really feeding, you're, you're feeding the demon that has them. See, Christians, Christians can't have a demon, but a demon can have a Christian. And, and I was there when Lester Soma was asked by the students, because he taught a class at Rama, They asked him, well, can a Christian have a devil? He said, all I know is that if there's a devil presence, present, it needs to be cast out. <laughs> and then I thought, well, if a Christian can't be possessed by a devil, can a devil have a Christian? The answer is yes, he can. Because he's always seeking who he may devour. You just don't be edible. Eat a lot of garlic or something. Or, you know, just, in other words, like, you, you don't present yourself as being vulnerable. Well, the only way to do that is to live from the mystery that's been revealed through the ages been hidden, but now it's been revealed, Christ in us. So all these, these, these virtues that you're supposed to add on layers, like, a, like a, a, someone who's laying brick, you just, 
I don't want to say amazing because you know amazing, I bet you, but because <laughs> then I'm going to get you know all this mail. <laughs> Just be like amazing, you know. No, is that thirty third degree or what is that? No, no. You you add you add to your faith these virtues that that um, at the end you have them in you in their abundant supply. Now this is this is where I got the book. It's rigged in your favor, which, which was the most controversial thing I've ever said. And it was the best-selling book, but it was like the hardest thing to go through because I hit a religious devil. There was a snake there all whole time. Everything was fine until Kevin wrote the book, Rigged in Your Favor. You can't tell people that you're misleading people. Well, that's what they told Or Roberts. You're misleading the people by telling them God is a good God. That's an exact quote. That is what the, his leadership told him. He said, well, I'll just go out and do a tent. Because that's the good news. Okay, it says here that if you, you possess these things and they're already in you, and it says they will keep you from being inactive or fruitless in your pursuit of knowing Jesus Christ more intimately. And then other translations, many, not just one, says that they, they will keep you from falling. So it's rigged in your favor. You can, you can get to where you don't fall. You don't fail. But it's doing the things that really are expected of you. But because of the environment, your, the temperature, the standard has been lowered. And if you keep giving up ground, then you're robbing people of being delivered and being healed and experiencing God's provision supernaturally in their life financially, if you start backing off the scriptures, then what happens is it's not just because it's not happening in your life. Then you prevent it from happening in others because you stop, you stop it from being proclaimed and you don't take a stand. So if you, if you, if you stand for righteousness and you set the bar high, like you should see how many of my partners and students are running for office now. I mean, my friends, they just let me, I'm going, and I mean, they're going to win. They really are going to win. They're they're really going to win. But see, this is what happens when the gospel produces fruit. It causes you to become the standard. Then you are the hands and feet and you represent righteousness, then you go and you represent the people correctly because you're righteous and just. So you bring that back to the system. It's through people. And it it has to happen at the lowest level and go to the top because it's corrupt at the top. That's why it was able to happen. Because if you look at the original intent, we were to send people, not not send them for 47 years where nothing happens in 47 years. But somebody in three and a half years does something and they send them down the river. But they couldn't fix it in 47 that they had? You got to remember that the people I'm talking about, I can mention their names. They were in the Senate and the House when JFK was president. Have you even done the math? The intent was that we would send citizens to represent us just for a couple years, then they would return to their job, and then someone else would go so that there wouldn't be any corruptness. That's why if you look, even the TSA, they don't stay in the same station very long. You won't see them. They rotate them around so that there's no way that they can let their friend through. And this happens with everything, with banks. Everything is so, so to help people be... Accountable, but if you have the same, the same beat, the same path, and you start to get in with the criminals, and you get bought out, well, then you look the other way. Well, then that whole precinct suffers. This is what happens when the balances are unjust. But see, God's people—it's already a given that these things are deposited in us. We cannot be something different. Okay, so the power of God's in here, so strong right now. And 
you know, I don't have to lay hands on you. This is, this is the body of Christ. This is the corporate noise. This is what Jesus showed me, is that if I would preach the good news and create an atmosphere for growth, that every one of you would rise up in your spirit, in the knowledge, and that we would feel the power of agreement within a room, and that the Lord said that no one will be able to go back from what they were when they walked in the meeting. And I said, well, that's a great deal. So that, just in five years, just in the five years we've been doing this, we've seen people, there's a backstop behind them where the door just disappears. It's, it's gone. It's all about forward motion. So if you have a setback, it's really not a setback. You'll see when you get to heaven that it was for your character. Because it's how you deal with discrepancies. It's how you deal with, with things changing, scenarios changing. It, it doesn't work out right. Your character is, is a, has to rise to the occasion to be a problem solver and a solution, to be a leader. When, when, when I was in certain situations, I just don't have time tonight to tell you some of the things that I've been in. I mean, amazing emergencies where everybody was looking for someone to do something and then they were just wanting to follow. They were waiting when they should be acting. They were wanting guidance and they were looking when everyone didn't really have that much time. But professionals are trained to just do what is on the list of they're supposed to do in a situation. Professionals will just go through that because it's already been done and determine what to do in any scenario. So if you have certain things going on, you have certain options, but time is of the essence in an emergency. So the more time you take waiting to do something or waiting for someone else to do something, the, the, the worse it gets to where your options become limited. Does everybody hear what I'm saying? So as you wait, because you're trying to figure it out, well, it's not long before you only have one or two options left, but you had seven or eight. It, it is maturity that you can look at something and say, okay, this is what we need to do, and we need to do this because it's already been established and proven, and these are people that already do this. So these apostles, these prophets, uh, Jesus, they all laid a foundation for us. They have already spoken certain things that we're not even doing. And so we're waiting for something to happen. We're waiting for someone to speak a word, a revelation, a dream. And the whole time Paul said, listen, you know those prophecies that I gave you, Timothy? He said, you take those words and you wage war with them. You have to wage war with the prophecies you received. Well, if they were in stone, then why would he have to take them and wage war with them? Because in the New Testament, the New Covenant, everything is by faith. By faith, which is action. Faith without works is dead. In other words, faith without action is dead. James said, you show me your faith by what you do. Okay, so if you want to if you want to engage what the Spirit of God is doing now and the move that is here, the power of God, you have to respond. And you have to enter in and take responsibility. Because when something happens, I want all of you to be the leader. Don't wait for someone else to offer to do CPR or to tell you what your egress is because there's an active shooter. You should have already determined your exit points. I do everywhere I go. But see, why is it that you have to watch a video and get scared of a church service that's disrupted? 
with, the, with somebody that's an active shooter. Oh, don't, you, don't talk about that. Well, it's like they didn't. They didn't either. Okay, so what happens if you get cancer and you don't even believe in it, but you get it? Well, then all of a sudden now, something is inside of you. It doesn't matter whether you believe in it or not. Now you're dealing with a doctor who's telling you stuff and you're going to have to decide, okay, now what do I do? Well, see, you have to determine ahead of time what your war is and your boundaries. You don't draw your lines of battle be, be, be after you get to battle. You determine the strategy and you send soldiers in with their command. This is how you operate in the spirit. You have to know the boundaries. Okay, so if you say to your immune system, be strengthened, and then after you say that and you pray for your health and you pray for your immune system, and then you get a word like me and my wife do, and we have to look it up. <laughs> and then when we look it up, we're like, oh my gosh, that's exactly what, we're, what the symptoms we're going through. So we go to Amazon and we buy it, and it's amazing. No pharmacia. And it's even next day delivery. Free. <laughs> you know, even though the delivery guy throws it at your door, it's still earlier. <laughs> so what happens is when you engage the spirit, now listen to me, when you engage the spirit, and you really have ears to hear, he's going to speak. Are you ready for what he's going to say? Now, if you're ready for what he's going to say, what I'm saying is, are you ready to act on it? Okay, are you ready to put action to it? Because when God says something, stuff starts happening. And the reason it hasn't happened in the last 10 years like it used to is because people, they didn't take it by faith. They didn't take it into themselves anymore. It became this, where you hear, oh, that's nice. Oh, bless, you know, bless the Lord. And you, you sit there, and the, the devils aren't even stirred. So when the Spirit moves upon you, what He's going to do is He's going to have you do something that in, in a, a perfect generation, it would be totally normal and everybody like, we're, right, we're with you. But see, if everybody's been hiding in a cave for two years and you've been doing it, and then all of a sudden, they realize you lost two years. And all of a sudden, they look at, we should have kept on moving with God and not allowed what was happening and, and encourage people, listen, we're praying for you. What do you need? How can we boost your immune system? Well, I'm wearing 10 masks. <laughs> no, 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 no. What, what's happening inside your body is they need, it needs those, that army of, of white blood cells and interferons and all these all these amazing cells and chemicals in your body, they, they need replenishment supplies. And they're like, please hold the macaroni and cheese. It's not what we ordered. We need, we need something that's got life in it. At least get us macaroni and cheese that has real cheese. And, and, and not that bako stuff because it has no bacon in it. No, you know. In other words, like we have been, we, we have been set up for failure, but you know, you're just finding this out. Okay, so you get to the place where the Spirit preempts you ahead of time. And what's going to happen is, is he's going to tell you to do something that everyone else should be doing, but you're going to be the only one that's going to do it. And the water's going to split. Because God's with you. But see, he's really with everybody, but they're not with him. So you have Moses, his face is glowing. And, and instead of coming up to him and to his level, they said, cover your face. 
Does that sum up the last two years? So you cover your face. See, it was a spiritual thing, but it was a physical thing. But see, what the, the evil spirits are doing is they're mocking. Six feet, why not seven? Six feet, buddy. Okay, we got through the first page. You see, what is uncommon in this generation will, could be common next generation if we do our job. We have to be leaders. We have to think of ourselves as leaders and not followers. And here's what's going to happen. This is what happened to me. This is what happened to me just a year ago. See, last night was an anniversary for me and my wife. But it wasn't a marriage. It was a special event that happened last night. But this is how it started. It happened a year ago last night. Okay, but it started way before that. We were in Dalton, Georgia. And it was a year and a half ago. And we, we were going to leave on Delta out of Chattanooga. And I don't know how they do it, but they can turn an hour and a half flight into seven hours. I don't know how they do that. How do they do that? It is a miracle. A really, really negative one. Okay, so we, leave, we, we would do our conferences, and like uh, we usually leave Monday morning, okay? So... The Lord puts on my heart, stay till Tuesday, and Monday, you're going to the Dalton Airport, which you could confuse the runway with a street. It's like a little, air, it's a baby airport with everything, like baby, like even the fuel truck is like a baby truck, <laughs> and everything's like baby, and <laughs> it's like, if, if you're not looking for it, you'll miss it. So, you know, at a couple hundred miles an hour, you, you, it's like, yeah, I'm going to land on that postage stamp. Because that's what it looks like from the air, okay? All right, so he says, go to the airport. And he said, I want you to go into the, the area there and stand. And I want you to look out at the runway. And I want you to stand there until you see, no. He said it. So this would be the time to get up and leave offended. But he said, until you see your jet land, you stand there until you see your jet land and park here. I'm like, I don't want a jet. I don't want, I, I've walked away from all that. He said, it doesn't matter. So I, I had them take me there. I had Dave take me there. And we stood in that lobby. And that, there's this guy there that Lou's met. And uh, he I, don't, I just don't know how to describe the whole thing, but he, I asked, I just stood there, and he stood there at the desk looking at me, and I just stood there, and I'm looking out, and, and um, you know, everybody around me knows, like, well, just wait until Kevin's done, and, you know, we'll find out in a year in a book what happened, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I did, I stood there. And I saw this jet pull up in my, in my imagination. So then I, he said, now go outside and stand. Like there was these chalks and there was like these little puddle jumper things. There's little like kites with engines on them. And they were sitting there and everything. I was like, that I used to train in, you know. So I just went out there and I stood on this spot. And he said, stand here until you see it pull up right here and park. No, I'm not kidding you. My wife was there. You can ask Dave. You can ask all the, the people all the, the, that were there. Uh, I can name their names, but then you'd go look for them, and then they'd say, why did you mention my name? <laughs> so, but the bottom line was I saw it, and it wasn't like, I, it wasn't like a kid's show, make-believe, you know, romper room or, or Mr. Rogers, you know, or Auntie Am or Toto. It was, it was like I... I really, I really, something happened in my heart. 
And you know what I'm talking about. It's not like, I didn't say anything. Uh, and I, I went home, and that guy just like, what are you, what are you doing? You know, I'm like, yeah, you can stand out there. And he's like, he's watching me stand out there. Okay, so a year ago last night, by a miracle, our plane was brought to New Orleans so that we could look at it, and we purchased it that night, a year ago last night. And we met Sven, whose friend is Lou, who's sitting here on the front row, who's flying with me this week, because Sven's in Germany. And me and Sven and my wife and his co-pilot, we all just sat around, and he goes, I want a copy of your book. Can you sign it? And he just says, tell me about heaven. And I go, I said, I'll tell you about heaven, but I just want you to know, you can take this off the market because it's ours. And he just looked at me because they've had four people that fell through four times in the last year. And Luke can attest to it. I couldn't sell it. But every time, the, per, the, the customer would say, OK, repaint it. Do, do, do the, the pre-buy. Do uh, the gear. Do, um. So the airplane, the, the interior was brand new. Everything was brand new. And then I called, and, I, and a guy's name was Cal. And he, he's like, yeah, yeah, real. Right, okay. And I'm like, no, I'm going to buy it. He goes, well, do you have the money? And I'm like, see, I'm thinking God's normal. Like, I don't call somebody if I don't have the money. And I'm like, do you want me to send you a snapshot? Because like, you can't make a copy of a bank website anyway. You can't, they won't let, it doesn't work. And there's a reason for that, because all your information's on there. But I said, I'll take a snapshot. I go, oh, better yet, I'll just send, I'll send you, Kathy and I will send you the down payment right now. He goes, okay, wire, wire it. So I wired it. And I go, now can I see my plane? He goes, well, it's out. I said, I will charter it. When can it be here? So I chartered the airplane and paid for it to come so I could look at it. I did, right? And um, Sven's watching right now. He's watching from Germany right now. He's watching us right now. Wave, wave Sven. He's, he's watching right now. OK, so he called Cal. He said, take it off the market. They're buying it. Are you sure? You know what's happened to us? He said, take it off. It's Kevin's. It's Kevin and Kathy's. That happened a year ago last night. OK. Now, this was not my idea, and you know, it's, it's, this is not my gig, okay? But it is my gig. I'm no longer a flight attendant. The praise in tongues, I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm going to be a captain in a month. That's after, because I got the best instructor. In a year, from not ever flying a jet to getting them a captain's rating, okay? This is not my idea, okay? But I had the foundation, and I kept moving. And God was there every step of the way, okay? So then when it was time to go back to Dalton, I didn't call Delta. <laughs> I got on a Phenom 300, and in an hour and 10 minutes where they're asking us to slow down. I landed at that airport and taxied up, and guess who was out there waiting to, to, to direct me in? The guy at the front desk that thought I was weird. <laughs> and he's like, and he goes, he's like, I'm serious. I'm serious. He's OK. So I get out, and I go, um, we'll be staying the weekend. You can, I'll set the panel with 4,500 pounds, and, um, you know, but we're going to be leaving Sunday instead of Monday. He goes, well, we don't come in until till noon. I go, no problem. And he's looking at me, and I'm like, yeah, it's me. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> now listen to me. Close the airplane up and walk through that lobby. And just in a matter of months, it had all changed. And I did nothing except stay in my track where I sought the kingdom. Yeah. 
I sought the face of God. I didn't, I didn't go after anything because I had died to it. And this is the thing that God's normal. He wants you to get to the place where you become available to do anything and nobody can take credit for it, including yourself. And you're not in it for the attention. You're in it to be lit up, to be display his glory. So from now on, and starting now, we're going to um, have, have Brittany and Jason and the, and the worship team come up and worship. And I want you, I want you to, to participate. You know, you can wait until August if you want, but... What is going to happen is it's going to be more comfortable for you to come up and kneel and pray and meet with God, even if it's just a couple minutes and get up and go and leave. But it's going to get to the place. I'm not doing this as a gimmick because I, I, I didn't go into the ministry for many years because of that. I didn't want it to be a gimmick, and I didn't want it to be about the money. I wanted it to be about people and about change, transformation. If there's anything that God wants, it's transformation. The devil doesn't know what to do with a Christian that's transformed. A devil has no way, no way to deal with somebody who says, no, we're not doing that. The the devil's, listen, is everybody listening? Wave your hand. Demons don't have a plan B. They don't know what it's like to be rejected. Demons don't meet people that resist them because their mode of operation is cloaked. So they make people think that it's them. They work on your mind and they isolate you. But see, you're loved here and you're accepted. And you're accepted in the beloved. You've been bought with a price, and there's a book written about you, and you have a destiny. There's a plan, a template for your life. Most people don't find it because it's a narrow way, and few find it. But there is a way. The way is is that those who try to preserve their life will lose it. And what you're believing for, is it worth dying for? Or, you know, because I would rather walk than believe for something that is really fast, a nice car that I have a focus on, and that's what I'm believing for. Well, would I die for that? In other words, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things are going to be added to you. Let God be your friend and initiate your adventure in faith. But if I were you, I would concentrate on the virtues, adding to your faith these virtues and become the person that in an emergency, people can depend upon you to not break down and to be strong. Listen, every one of us know when somebody's talking from the fire and when they're not. Everybody knows when God's there and when he's not. You, you can't fake the glory. You, and the glory is change. Glory, the cloud, creates transformation it brings God's normal in. But it's, listen, it's habitation. It's not visitation. And it's not revelation. We've gone through the phase of revelation. We've had more than enough revelation. It's so heavy revy that we're not moving. We need to get moving, motivated, locomotive, you know. It should, it should get you out on the tarmac, looking. It should move you. It should be something that is not normal, that is coming, and you better go ahead and take the step of faith. And it's not, it's not going and buying it. It's going out and seeing it coming. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the title deed, the evidence of things not seen. If you want to bring the Bible into it. It is the title deed of what you cannot see. I have it. I have righteousness, I have holiness, I have eternal life through Jesus Christ. I have everything I need for life and godliness. According to scripture, I have all these things. I'm gonna get exceedingly abundantly above what I could ask or think. 
because I know God's will. I don't ask for God's will. I demand it. Now that sounds too bold, but then you're not going to like heaven because people, it's full of people like this. It's full of people that grab a hold and will not let go. They will not let go. And you meet a couple of those here and there in history, you know, and you, you, you say, man, I'd like to be like you. And like, oh, the price would be too high for you. You're a snowflake. You know, one degree and you melt. One degree difference. Something changes in the atmosphere and somebody looks at you wrong. You're, you're done. You're opt, you've opted out until it goes back to 32 degrees. And you can be a snowflake again. I'm telling you, listen, somebody has got, I, listen, I'd rather tell you the truth than be your friend. But I'm going to be your friend too. But Paul said, if I now become your enemy, because I told you the truth. That's what he said as an apostle. He said, you have many teachers, but you have very few fathers. I birthed you and I am jealous over you. That is a true apostle. So the, that man fought for people. He wrestled in prayer for people, but he transferred to others so that they could do the work of the ministry. And so there's got to come this point where you realize you're a leader. There is no one else because we're not going to sit around and wait for the next thing that they devise to come our way. And we're going to be, find ourselves in the exact same thing. We're going to go for the Lysol and the toilet paper. <laughs> but see, that's the old wineskin. What if you find out that your, your thoughts have been manipulated? What if, if you find out that, you're, that your emotions are rogue? What if you find out that people that have had bad things happen to them, what if you find out that between them and God, there was things that, because I find this out, because I've had it happen to me. The Lord says, don't go this way to work. You go this way. Don't do this. You're not going here. You're going to schedule this for this day. You know, it happened, it happened the Friday before 9-11. Jesus came up behind me. Kathy is in the house. She comes out with a cooler, and Jesus is behind me, and he goes, you are not flying on, on September 11th. Because the worst incident in aviation history is going to occur, and you cannot fly that flight where you end up Baltimore the first leg in the morning and then, and then on to Islip, New York for your overnight. You're not gonna do that. So I told Kathy, I told her right there. So we spent the whole weekend praying and interceding. And then I got rid of that trip. I gave it to someone else. Don't be mad at me, but I'm just not gonna fly it. I gave it to someone else who didn't have Jesus appear to him. Probably doesn't even know Jesus. Okay, so why was I privileged to get that information? Well, it's, I don't think that's the question. What do you do if you were the person chosen to give that information to? So would you be mad at me that I took all my stocks out on Friday and sold everything and put it into a money market fund? I mean, what would you do if you knew that was gonna happen and the markets are gonna crash? Would you, or would you be mad at me that I did that? Because I did that. And it happened two other times beside that where the markets crashed. And as a flight attendant, I got out before it happened. Okay, I'm telling you this because it's not about like if God's favoring you or not favoring you. If you're told something, can you do it? Can you be trusted? Are you all following me? Yeah. Yeah. So to be called is one thing, but to be chosen is, means that you went through the selection prog process and you went through and you were qualified and found that you qualified and you were chosen. That's what that means. So many are called, but few are chosen. You're Gideon's army. So you whittle it down from 32,000 down to 300, and then that'll do, 300 will do. Well, obviously the rest of them were just taking up space. 
So all of us have to make a decision in our lives. This is this message doesn't pertain to you as much as it does to a lot of people that are in the balances, okay? If you're here, it's because you care and you want to learn and you want to know. This is not to in any way judge you at all. This is to show you the hesitation that happens with people that have not been fully convinced of who their God is. And I've met him and I was sent back and given a second chance. Most people don't get a second chance to do it right. I miserably failed the first time. When I got my audit with Jesus, I was shown the rewards that I would get, which was a lot. He said, well done. But immediately when he said that, he smiled. And then in a flash, everything that I could have done and didn't do was shown to me. I was shown the record of what was written about me. And I had only done about 35% of that. And what it was, it was opportunities where I did not act on my faith. I did not take the opportunity that was placed before me. I hope that someone else fed that person who needed food or took care of that or spoke that word, you know, or went three hours when everybody's like, please, you just shut up. But that, people, you, people don't do that with us because I'm speaking by the Spirit. And you can get up and leave anytime you want, but I'd wait until you're fully offended before you leave. I mean, at least get really, really chalked full. I mean, walk out mad. Kick the dog and the cat. No, you, you get what I'm saying. Is that the action that comes from, from the habitation of the Lord is that Moses did not know that his face glowed. But through association, he became like his creator because he went back to the original Adam and Eve. Because his environment was normal, but it was God's normal. This man was a great man. Moses was a great man. Jesus spoke highly of him. It was the, the person that he spoke about the most in my 45 minutes with Jesus was Moses. And he explained to me all the dynamics that I had to transfer to you all about what was going on there and what's going on in my assignment here. And that is, is that Moses through association got there, but he wasn't operating in the understanding of it. And so we don't have to understand healing to get healed. We don't have to understand praying in the spirit and speaking in tongues to speak in tongues. The supernatural, you don't have to explain it or understand it or be on a show called it. I just want to experience it. And it shouldn't draw attention to you. Yield to it because everybody else needs to jump in. When are you going to get over yourself? And the devils are saying, oh, don't tell them that. We got them all wound up. See, you're looking at yourself and you're maxed out. And God has the money for your bills. He has provision for you. He's going to tell you what brook to go to. He's going to tell you what, you know, He's going to place you where you need to be. He's got a plan. It's not over. I'm telling you. You pray in the spirit until you have the title deed. Then you go out there and you let the spirit show you the future. And then you hold on to a good God, a good father that wants to give you the kingdom. He's not going to give you a snake. If you ask for bread. He loves you. But I'm telling you, it's time. It's time to be able to fit your head through the narrow way. Faith is of the heart. It's not of the head. Your, your brain is not made to receive spiritual things. Okay? Okay? 
I'm going to wait a little longer. As you rest here in the Spirit of God, receive the empowerment from on high. Receive your healing. You don't need me to lay hands on you. You don't need the fire tunnel. It's already installed in your seat. The Lord is coming to you. We have a mobile courts of heaven. You don't have to go to the courts of heaven. They've come to you. Come on now. God has already decided in his righteousness, and he has voted in your favor by sending Jesus Christ. There's nothing left to do except just go ahead and turn yourself in right now and give those devils a headache. Those familiar spirits, they've been lying to you. They've, they've, they've changed your personality thinking it's you. They have worked on your mindset and you're free. You're free in Jesus' name right now. I come against every lying devil right now in the name of Jesus. I break every power, every lying devil right now in the name of Jesus. I break your power and I say in the name of Jesus and by the blood, I cast you out. I drive you out right now. You foul lying devils, you go. Shut up and go. Not one word. Don't touch their property. Don't touch anything of them. There's just go. Yes, you're leaving now. On your way. In Jesus' name. Gee, while I was speaking that, I went right into the future. I went right into the future. I didn't know I was here anymore. And what I saw was, I saw the end of the ages. We all make it. We're all in one accord. We're singing at the throne. And we're just glad that God was faithful. I was in the future. I saw it. We make it. We make it. We make it. There's a couple devils still hanging on, and this is why. You, you need to know that your file has been expunged. When a judge expunges your file, that means it never existed. It doesn't have a docket number. There's no file. I'm telling you by the Spirit of God, there are those of you who feel like you have messed up too bad. And I'm telling you, Romans 8 in the Aramaic says, there is no condemning voice against you. The case against you is closed. There's no accusing voice against you. The case against you is closed. It's gone. When I was in heaven, Jesus was talking to me as though I'd never sinned. He was talking, he was talking me up. He wasn't looking down at me. He was calling me Kevin. I wasn't an apostle. I, wasn't, I was Kevin. And he said, Kevin, you're down here qualifying for your next position with me. He said, you are coming to heaven, but this is an audit down here. You are on probation, qualifying for your next position. He said, so submit to the yoke of the Lord and learn of me. And he said, everything you learn down here is qualifying you. And he showed me, he said, look, and I looked down and I had that beautiful oriental robe that was, was that, that uh, Black Hills gold, rose gold. It was, it was a uniform from, from my neck down to my toes. I was, it was a beautiful with, with those, those uh, buttons that go the whole way down, the high collar, really cool collar that goes the whole way down. And um, I went like this and when I looked, I had at least seven stripes on my arm. And I thought four was great. I had seven and I had patches and they were territories that I was over. They were like, sort of like countries, but they were, the borders were changed. And I was over these and I had all these, I was, uh, and Jesus looked at me and I looked in his eyes and he was talking to me and as he, I looked, he didn't think that I had ever sinned. There was no record in heaven that I had ever sinned and so I looked in his eyes and he didn't even know that I had sinned. So I'm telling you, this is what's going to happen to you. And you're going to like kick yourself. Why you were so hard on yourself down here. 
Either you're forgiven or you're not. If you're not, just come up here. I'll take care of it for you. And it's a hands-free ministry, so you don't have to worry about me slapping you. I just, it's hands-free. But you're forgiven. And he really didn't know that I had sinned because it was completely washed away and gone. So he didn't have any knowledge. So when he talks to you in heaven, it's as though you never sinned. And this is what he said. You, Kevin, are going to rule and reign with me shoulder to shoulder forever. Amen. And so I could feel his shoulder on my shoulder and I, I feel his, he's pleased. He's pleased with me. Not because I'm a good boy or I've been to heaven and back, but because I believe in the one who created me and then bought me and it was good. The blood was enough. And I saw that this is why demons hold on in this room is because you can't forgive yourself. You can't accept the fact that you've been forgiven and you really have been. I had limited myself while I was on the earth. I was afraid to pray for people because they might not get healed. I was afraid to give people a word because it might not be right. I was, I was always backing off of everything. And the Lord said to me, I'm the healer, you're the prayer. He said, he said you're, not, you're not the healer. That's my job, you pray. You cast out demons, they will go in my name. I, I, they go because they see me, not you, Kevin. I'm serious. So love, the love walk will, will cause you to release yourself to him as a bride would release herself to her husband. And I mean that male and female. Let's be clear here. There's no, there's no Adam and Steve, you know, in it. it's Adam and Eve. But, but here's the process of you getting out of this. The demons have something they can hook you with. Jesus said the evil one's coming, but he has nothing to hook himself in. There's no flesh hook that can get in to him. He has nothing in me. This is possible according to scripture tonight. You saw this with Peter. This will keep you from failing and falling and present you blameless is what the scripture says in other translations, present you blameless before him. So it is possible. Okay, so let's all, let's all stand. Let's receive his love right now. And I, I can prophesy. I can prophesy from the fire. I'm going to have Kathy prophesy from the fire. I'm going to have Brittany prophesy from the fire. And then tomorrow, we're not going to start over again. We're going to, we're going to start right here where we're at in the spirit. We're not going to let the devil steal one seed from you. We're going to start right where we're at in the morning and we don't have to work it up because we are the church, the body of Christ. We're the church of the living God and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. That is the absolute truth. So I can sense in my spirit that you're coming down with a revelation and you're coming down with a healing right now. And I can sense that you're coming down with a deliverance and that the devils are losing their grip because they can't operate in a Christian that accepts, they cannot operate in a, in a life of a Christian that accepts the perfect will of God because they're perfected in love. Now, now, now I'm not talking to you like I'm giving you a bedtime story and you're, you're seven years old and I've just given you milk and I'm gonna put you to sleep. This is not a bedtime story. This is absolutely what all the apostles preached and died for. This is the message that was preached. It sounds too good to be true because that's what the word gospel means. It means it's so good it's hard to believe. But Jesus said, believe that you receive it when you say it, when you pray it, and you shall have it. You don't wait till it comes to believe it. When you pray, you believe you have it. That's what Jesus said. It wasn't Kenneth Hagin. That's not Kenneth Hagin talking in Mark 11, 23 and 24. That's Jesus the one that created you. 
And he set this thing in motion. And he said, if you speak to your mountain, it will be removed. If you believe in your heart that what you say with your mouth shall come to pass, you shall have it. I am not going to back off of this. Listen, listen, you, you can not give any offering. I'll still come back. I'll go back to work if I have to. I already have. I'm, I'm doing this because this is the truth. I'm totally sold out. It's totally worth it. It's totally worth it to do it because he's worth it. So I, ha I, I have to say this, and I'm going to, Kathy, you got the microphone. I have to say this because the Spirit is, says, tell them about Malachi. I call it Malachi, but it's Malachi. And it says that your words have been stout against me. In other words, they've been against me. It's been pretty hard. What you've been saying about me, saith the Lord. So Malachi had to prophesy to the people and say, thus saith the Lord, your words have been stout against me. And they go, how have our words been stout against you? It's one of those interactive prophets, I guess. So he said, he said, thus saith the Lord, because you have said it doesn't pay to serve God. And it says later on, a couple verses later, because we don't, we read, we get bombarded because it's offering time and you get Mal Malachi 310, but there's Malachi 16 through 25 too, which talks about this. It says that those who spoke well of the Lord that day, it says a book of remembrance was written concerning them. Their names were written in a book. Well, the angels probably did that. They wrote a book with their names in it that they had spoke well of the Lord. Well, that would be just, if you haven't been following along, it'll be like, God is a good God. He's going around healing everyone that's oppressed to the devil. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. Okay, so these kind of people, that's your hint, those people, it says, will be honored in the day of the Lord. They will be jewels in my crown, and they will receive their reward publicly because they decided to speak well of the Lord. Is anybody hearing this? Yeah. That has nothing to do with your tithe. <laughs> so tonight... Let's prophesy. Let's prophesy from our spirit. And let's say something good about the Lord. Like, like I'll tell you what, some hints. He likes to hear, Lord, if you don't go with me, I'm not going. He likes to hear, if you're not with me today, it's going to be a really hard day. And he likes this. There's no one above you. You're the most high God. He goes, there is no one higher than you, Lord. He loves to hear stuff like that. You're the, you're the most high. You're the wisest. And in our favorite scripture, Kathy and I, it's like the Lord even says, search around and find if there's anyone greater than me. You'll find none. Right. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hello. Hallelujah. Yes, God's a good God. And... Let's just stay at what Kevin was just sharing. That was the Lord. The fire's here, and he is saying that we're at a tipping point. It's like, have you ever watched water boil or watch it not boil? And there's that point where it's not boiling, and then all of a sudden it is boiling. And that's right where we are right now. And the Lord just gave us a key. It's about our words. So if you're that person that said oops, I, my words have been stout. You know, I have hurt God with my words and said it's not, it doesn't pay to save, serve God. You know, just repent. And then, like the Lord was saying through Kevin, we can say good thing about the Lord, you know. And we're going to do that. You know, we're at a tipping point. So the word I got before... I came up here was rapid restoration and that's what's going to happen that's what's going to happen tonight while we're worshiping
And while we're speaking good things to the Lord, you're going to have rapid restoration. And those places that were desolate and void of life, that restoration is going to come. A nation can be born in a day. Restoration can happen in a day. And everything that you thought wouldn't move can move today. It can move in a moment. Okay? And it says in Philippians, he's the man of God said, I apprehend what I was apprehended for. What Christ Jesus apprehended for us, we apprehend that. So just believe this weekend, tonight, from here on out, that you're going to receive and apprehend what you were apprehended for, what Jesus Christ apprehended for you. Just like say, Lord, I, I receive that. Be aggressive. I receive what you've paid that price for me. Just, just lift up our hands. And lacuna lable estumo orama samble estuma ashe reda vushne raflande. We receive rasheneke, rasheneke. We receive rapid restoration. We receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to see, save our souls. We receive the fire. We rasana keleveshe the holy fire. The fire from the altar. Malamande le embolo puta mande. We give you permission, Lord, to burn up the dross. Refiner's fire. Holy fire. Rafana shlade. Rafana shlavede. Rafashla fane kitave. Eshenete, ete moto, yepeke, you paved the way, Lord. You've made the way. Matalamande, esho, ha ha, ha ha, wokidiasenekete, orashianekete, she, ranekia makayato, lamande, lamande, from glory to glory, to glory to glory, from revelation to revelation. The story of your glory, the story of your glory, clothed with glory and honor, high and lifted up. We see you high and lifted up. We see you high and lifted up. And wikiyamoto, 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 ha ha, shanehe.
can't go back, I can't go back And I won't go back to where I've come from Cause you've brought me too far, there's no going back And I just have to say thank you That you keep no record of my wrong Oh thank you That you don't keep tally of what I've done Oh thank you That you don't keep a record of my wrong I'm forgiven I'm forgiven And I have to say thank you That you don't keep a record of my wrong I say thank you That you don't keep tally of what I've done I say thank you I'm forgiven I'm whole and I'm free Yes, I'm free I have to say thank you That you don't keep a record of my wrong Oh, thank you You don't keep tally of what I've done I say thank you That you've set me free You've set me free Forever, forever You don't keep a record of my wrong You don't keep tally of what I've done I say thank you I say thank you God, thank you that you don't air my dirty laundry You say I'm forgiven And you wash me white as snow Oh, I say thank you I say thank you How could I hold my love back from you? Such a good lover to me. I could never go back. I could never go back. I could never go back now. And I would never want to anyway. Cause you love so well. And you hold my so well oh thank you I have to say thank you that you don't keep a record of my wrong you say it's finished it's done and you call me holy and you pick me up and you place my feet Upon the solid rock I say thank you Jesus Thank you Father Thank you Holy Spirit For all you've done for me You came and opened my prison doors You came and broke every chain Every chain of my life Every place that had me bound I'm never going back Cause I've tasted freedom Only you can give I'm never going back Cause I've tasted freedom Only you can give I'm never going back Cause I've tasted freedom Only you can give And I have to say thank you Cause
Jesus and I will pour my heart my oil on you Jesus and I will pour my heart my oil on you Jesus and I will pour my heart my oil on you Jesus and I will pour my heart, my oil on you, Jesus. Tell him tonight that I will pour my heart, my oil on you, Jesus. And I will pour my heart, my oil on you, Jesus. And I will pour my heart, my oil on you, Jesus. No matter the cost, no matter the cost, I will pour my heart on you. Oh, no matter the cost, no matter the cost. Whatever I have to give up, it's worth it for you. Whatever I have to lay down, it's worth it for you. No matter the cost, you're worth it all. You're worth it all, God. You're worth it all. <laughs> so much better than what this world could ever offer you are so much better <laughs> so much better than anything this world could offer me you are 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 so much better so much better <laughs> yes you are Father, open our eyes tonight to see us the way you do, to see us the way you do. We're so hungry, we're so desperate. Jesus, we love you. Help me see me the way you do. Help us see the way you see. Help us love the way you love. Let me see the way you see me. Let me know exactly how you feel about me. Let me see me the way you see. You don't see me broken the way I see me. <laughs> you don't see me broken the way I see me. Help me see the way you do. Cause you don't see me broken the way I see me. Oh, shift our perspective. Shift our perspective to see the way you do. Just to love the way you do. Just to love me the way you do. You have my yes, Lord. You have my yes, Lord. Time and time again. Time and time again. You have my heart.
heart. You have my heart. You have my heart. There's none like you. There is none like you. There is none like you, Jesus. There is none like you. You make every crooked place straight for me. You clear the path in front of me. There is none like you. There is no like you. Oh, Jesus, in my life be lifted high. <laughs> Cause there is none, there is none like you. None like you, Jesus. There's none like you, Jesus. There's none like you. There's none like you. I never have to be afraid, cause you always make a way. Cause there's none like you. 